What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to episode 39 of The Silver and Gold. I'm Josh. And I'm Mike. And uh, it's been another two-week period without another episode, but, I mean, we're here to stay. So even though there's no episode going on, like we're kind of like in the middle of the off-season, you know, free agency kind of slowed down a little bit. Uh, We're gearing up towards the draft, and, you know, the more news comes out, the the more videos you guys should see so uh we're gonna be talking today obviously if you're tuning in right now you've seen the thumbnail brandon Ayuk is on the cover and we're going to discuss whether or not there's any substance to him going to the raiders that will be later in the episode for right now we're going to start with our first topic uh we're going to talk about the hip drop tackle ban and you know this is a topic that i wish Mike and I would have had this podcast when we were debating on whether or not this should have been banned because I definitely was on one side and Mike was definitely on the other side of, you know, the, the discussion or I guess the argument. Um, so I used to be of the belief that, man, you can't ban the hip drop tackle. Like I, it's already impossible to play defense in the NFL and you're just making it harder for defenders to play defense. Like you can't, you can't hit them hard. You can't hit them high. You can't hit them low. And, and, you know, now you can't even drag them down. Like, uh, that, that to me was like, man, we're getting closer and closer to flag football, but I have to say, I think, I think the NFL kind of, maybe botch the criteria a little bit, but I think Mike and I kind of understand what the NFL means by hip drop tackles, because I think that there's a difference between what they're outlawing versus being able to just drag someone down. And, um, you know, hip drop tackles, the ones that have like resulted in injuries almost always result or, you know, are occurred when the player like pulls themselves up and swivels their body on top of the legs of, of other players. And yeah. I used to think like, you know, that's ridiculous. Mike showed me this like video. I don't know if we can play it without like, you know, getting another oh, copyright. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's, there's a clear difference. If you look at people getting dragged down from behind and then, and then like look at all the injuries from hip drop tackles. It's different. They, they, you know, like I said, they pull themselves kind of up and get on the legs, whether it's intentional or not. I don't think it's intentional, but I think that Mike sort of swayed me over to his side in me believing that it also should be a penalty. It, it should be a penalty. Um, it, the questionable aspect to this is how are the refs going to call it? That's where the fear comes in, I think, as far as for defenders and for a fan of the game overall. I think, it, simply put, if you go back and you watch Mark Andrews' injury from November, December, this past season against the Bengals, that is a clear hip drop tackle. Now, it is not, to me, a hip drop tackle. If you're tackling from behind, 
and you grab their legs, right? You're running behind them, you catch up to them, and you dive at them and get their legs. That's not a hip drop. A hip drop is when you tackle them or you go to tackle them, you wrap around like their waist, and you twist your body around them and put your weight down. Like your body's in the air, and then you go weightless on them, and you're you kind of corkscrew your legs into their legs and your weight goes on their legs as they're planted leading to a fractured fibula, a broken fucking ankle or whatever, right? That should be outlawed that you can tackle in other ways. You could just go for the feet and I get it. The big, the reason why these defenders are like, Oh, what are we supposed to do is because they, they can't go straight for the knees. Rightfully. So you're going to tear somebody's leg up. That's what the Lions defensive back did to TJ Hawkinson. He went right for his leg, his knee, tore his ACL. I got TJ Hawkinson on Dynasty Fantasy. I'm, I'm a little upset about it, you know? But at the end of the day, it's not about fantasy football. It's about these dudes' careers. TJ Hawkinson, he's a great player. He'll, he'll be fine. If that were fourth string tight end of the Minnesota Vikings, his career is over. You know? That's the difference. So they shouldn't be allowed to go out there and hip drop or aim for the knees. I get why these defenders are all up in arms. Like, well, what are we supposed to do? Oh, I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. Do what you're taught to do. Body up. Go for the feet. Whatever you got to do. Just don't go weightless on their legs. That You're just going to break something. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, pull them to the ground. Don't pull yourself up on top of them. Yeah. And again, I guess the, the main, not the main point, but the other point I was making was the, the fear here is how are the referees going to call this? Because just like roughing the passer or pass interference, you have those horrible calls made by officials. Are they going to make an example of this early on and make it like unbearable for even fans, let alone the defenders? We'll see. In my opinion... Hip drop tackles don't happen that often. All this hoopla about, oh, how are we supposed to tackle? I don't really get it because I don't think hip drop tackles happen that often. You Honestly, usually it's when you're tackling from the front or the side. But you can do it from behind, too. You can grab them and then somehow pull your body up. But when you're running directly behind somebody, you're just going to dive at their feet or at their, you know, like their, their kind of tailbone, you know. As long as you don't pull your body towards them and over their legs, it's not a hip drop. So just go for the legs, like go for the feet, trip them up. Or if you're going head to head, hit them like a linebacker should and get right in his belly and wrap them. You're supposed to wrap around them. Yeah. I really think that the NFL kind of created this monster, you know, because over the past, uh, several years they've been trying to take the violence out of football and you can't run through people anymore. Like if you, if you tackled someone hard enough, you're going to get a targeting penalty. Yeah. You yeah. Know? I mean, really, and it if, didn't if used to be hard, that way. No, I mean, I'm actually curious what the rule is for going for the legs on non quarterbacks. There might not be a rule. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's the case, that might be, the onset, uh, you know, the consequence, the consequence of this ruling, you know, but yeah, you're going to get more TJ Hawkinson injuries. Yeah. And that, that would be definitely the worry um, for, you know, for the play of these players. But I, again, I just don't think hip drops happen like that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm curious what the rules are for like hitting for the knees. I know obviously hitting towards the helmet, that's where all the big penalties come in, but mm -hmm. that's for a reason, you know? I think, so. you know, maybe the problem at hand is not, I mean, cause there's a lot of people that are upset with, uh, you know, hip drop tackle, you know, being banned and it's going to be, I think probably a 15 yard penalty. What if the punishment was different? Like, Okay, what if you're able, what if they can set up a system where players are still allowed to hip drop tackle, so nobody's upset about that, but if you injure a player, you're you're ejected from the game, 
you know, if you injure a player from a hip drop tackle, you're ejected from the game. Like, and I'm talking about like broken bone, you know what I mean? Cause people would just abuse it. Like, you know, Oh, I sprained my ankle. You know what I mean? Like neither player can return to the game. Right. No, uh, you know, I, I feel like it would be abused. Well, you get ejected, be, possibly suspended. Seeing be, like if Michael, somebody okay. did clearly abuse it, though, that player could be suspended. I don't know. Right. I I, you know, I just thought about this right now, like literally in, in one minute. So so don't don't hold me to it. Again, I don't think hip drop tackles happen that often. I think doing the penalty is fine. You know the fifteen yard penalty. If we'll see how it goes, they can always change it next year. Um, I think it was Ted Nguyen, maybe it was somebody else, maybe it was Mel Moten. I'm not sure, but somebody tweeted that uh, they thought that you know tacking on the fifteen penalty to this ruling was interesting because the National Rugby League, wherever that is, uh, actually also had a ruling on like the hip drop type tackle in rugby. And they essentially outlawed it, but instead of causing a penalty of some sort, they just go straight to fines. So if the players, you know, don't want to get fined, they shouldn't do the hip drop. But it won't be like a penalty in that league. Maybe that's what they should have done. I'm not sure. Um, Either way, you go for a player's pocketbooks, they're probably not going to do that thing, right? Well... Actually, I don't know if you recall at some point like this past season, there was like a week of people just getting fined a lot. Like I think Quan Alexander got fined for what looked like should have been a like looked like a normal standard tackle. I don't know if you remember it. Um, I'm not sure. But the NFL does just fine players for like random plays, you know, so I'm sure that with these penalties are coming the fines. But obviously, they're adding the 15-yard, you know, flag on top of it. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I mean, we'll see how it goes this season for sure. Yeah, it's going to be a slippery slope. Um, and, you know, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next topic. Um, unless you have one one final thing that you want to say about it. Um, no, no. No comments on this one, so, yeah. All right. Our next topic, uh, we're going to be talking about Jed York is going to officially become the owner of the 49ers. And uh, I saw this, I guess, you know, this came out um, this morning uh, out of the owners meetings. And I guess that Jed York is going to be buying, you know, buying out, um, I guess, the majority portion of the 49ers from his parents. Um, so Jed York has been with the organization um, for, you know, for a long time now, he's been the, you know, CEO for, you know, at least since I've been watching the football team. Um, and the DeBartolo York family. So Denise DeBartolo York took over the 49ers once Eddie DeBartolo, I guess had a scandal I think it was sometime around 1999 uh, to 2000. They transferred the team over to uh, Denise DeBartolo York. Um, and then John York was also, you know, since he's married to Denise DeBartolo York, um, uh, also w- was an owner. They've got their son, Jed. They promoted Jed to CEO once he was old enough. And, you know, he kind of oversees the football operations and they only step in when when they they feel like they they have the need to step in. But it seems like we're going to be moving in a direction, or at least the Yorks are going to be moving into a direction where um, Denise and John York are not going to be overseeing anything in regards to the football, you know, in Mm -hmm. in regards to the 49ers. You know, that's going to be, when when we talk about like the top of the food chain, we're, we're going to have, like, it's just going to be Jed York. Which, I mean, I don't know how much will change, but I I definitely do know that it's either going to be good or bad that Jed York is not going to have somebody kind of over his shoulder. And it's going to be like 
you know, if things are not going well inside the organiz- organization, you can't blame it on one of three owners or like you can't blame it on maybe, you know, it's the CEO, maybe it's the owners, like, you know, the technical owners, but, you know, you don't know how involved they are. Jed York seems pretty involved. He was talking a lot before the Super Bowl about how much he talks with Kyle and John Lynch about, you know, the the state of the football team. And now he is going to be solely responsible. There will be no question about who is responsible for this football team. It's, you know, it's Jed, it's going to be Jed York moving forward. I don't know when this deal is going to be official, but uh, it'll just be interesting. I don't think much is going to change personally, but if they win a Super Bowl, we might be looking at, uh, you know, maybe maybe Jed was not, uh, I guess, making the best decisions when he was getting called into question by his parents. That's assuming that they called him into question. You know what I mean? We don't know mm-hmm. enough about these billionaires. So, um, I don't know, Mike, what do you think? Uh, do you think that anything is going to really change like from your outside perspective? Or is it just going to be business as usual for the 49ers? Well, from my outside perspective, I thought he always was the primary owner. I didn't realize like there was a whole bigger cast of owners. Um, but this makes sense, at least in the sense that he seemed, again, from the outside looking in, like he was always the primary decision maker as the acting owner of the Niners. So... I think maybe I don't I don't know any pros and cons to this other than maybe it just makes it easier for him to go about his business, you know. Mm. Not that there's really that much for him to do. At least I don't I don't know how owners work, so. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't yeah. seem like a big ground shaking thing or anything to me. I, I guess yeah. if anything, yeah. From from your perspective, it can be well. Now I know I can put the blame on him, but I think that's kind of what it always has been, you know. Mm -hmm. so yeah because he's always been the ceo it's just a matter of you know now it's like he is top of the food chain like there will be nobody else above him uh, like like there was before Mm. so that's all that's all i really had to say about that i just kind of wanted to to you know talk about it a little bit maybe discuss how it might be good how it won't really change anything but let's talk about uh something that has changed i'm gonna pull up the spreadsheet that we've been kind of going over over the last uh you know few shows um you know with the 49ers depth chart that i kind of you know made let's see here uh 49ers depth chart silver and gold got it all right let me zoom out so you guys can see it then i'm going to share screen 49ers have been working their ass off in free agency, I feel like. Um, yeah. So uh, the the first, you know, I, I guess we'll start with the offense. Uh, first things first, the 49ers got their quarterback. I'm presuming it's going to be quarterback two, but I have, them, I have Joshua Dobbs, who is the, the player that they signed in free agency uh, to a one-year deal. I have him listed as quarterback three because I never know truly what, Kyle Shanahan feels about a particular player until they pad up and until like they release the official depth chart. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say, I believe 100% without a doubt Dobbs is probably better than Brandon Allen. Um, You guys who have been watching the show, you know, for this past season, if you've been watching regularly, we've talked about Josh Dobbs probably like three times, you know, he played against the 49ers, um, once, you know, you know what, we might've talked about him two times, but you know, he runs fearlessly. He is like, you know, the, he <clears throat> is in my opinion, a perfect candidate to be back up to Brock Purdy. And I wish I would have thought of him sooner, but I just didn't think that Kyle Shanahan would be interested in Josh Dobbs, but it kind of makes sense. Like, um, he is apparently, you know, they, they call him the pastronaut. I guess he is involved in some sort of astro, you know, uh, 
what, what would you refer to that as mike is like um, uh, astrophysicist. an astrophysicist is he an I astrophysicist he probably studied that yeah mm -hmm. astrophysics yeah so so if he studied astrophysics he can learn a, a football playbook you know and people always talk about how shanahan's playbook is so complex and you know it takes time to pick up he just played under uh, Jonathan Gannon, but then went to the Minnesota Vikings and then played under Kevin O'Connell. Um, so, you know, he played, he played pretty well. Like I thought he played really well for the, the Cardinals. Um, and then on the Vikings, he like started off pretty good and then kind of tailed off. And then obviously had that like, you know, um, game against the Raiders where they didn't score all but one field goal. Mm. Um, but they still won. Um, just had to rub it into you Raider fans watching. Um, well, he, he, the thing about Dobbs to me that was very impressive was he came in on a fly and just started winning games for the Vikings, not knowing he didn't know his center's name and he was taking snaps from them. You know, like he, he got flown out like on Saturday, he played on Sunday. Like that's mm -hmm. how it worked for him week one. And, uh, you know, credit to him and also credit to Kevin O'Connell. I just think uh, it, not many quarterbacks can do what he did for the Vikings his first maybe two weeks of that little run that he had with them. Um, and he was super impressive, you know. And I remember him playing for the Titans on, like, Monday Night Football, like, two seasons ago against, I think, the Ravens. And it was just, like, an ugly performance. Um, but in part because the Titans, I think, were super injured and, it, it just, yeah, but didn't he start a playoff clearly, game? He might have. He honestly might have. It's just, it's clear to me that he's grown in the past season, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you consider the way that Brock Purdy plays and what I saw from Josh Dobbs, I see the similarities. Not in the sense that Josh Dobbs is going to be the next Brock Purdy, that's not happening. Yeah, But I think in the sense that he is a great backup for the 49ers under Kyle Shanahan, I completely see it. Okay, so I'm looking here. Um, I'm pretty sure that Josh Dobbs started a playoff game for the Titans. You might be right. I, because I think, so. I, I think, I think that they uh, went into the game, Tannehill was hurt, and it seemed like it was going to be Malik Willis you know, who was probably going to start. And then just out of nowhere, Josh Dobbs off the street, he's starting. Yeah. So I don't know honestly, how many pass attempts. I don't know how many pass attempts he had in that game. I want to say they tried to run as much as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think, I think like J Josh Dobbs on the Titans and Cardinals relative to the Vikings and what I think will be the Niners. Um, I think you can see a massive difference in coaching and like prefer preparation, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, I just think Dobbs is going to fit really well with Shanahan. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think with the Titans, maybe he didn't. And just the Titans weren't that well-prepped offense for a backup quarterback. Yeah, no. Um, honestly, I really feel like um, the fact that he can come in off the street come into an offense, play well, you know, well enough to win games. Like, you know, he beat the Cowboys this past year on the Cardinals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't they blow yeah. him out? Or it was like, they, you know, they, a they fairly large him. gap. Yeah. They, they embarrassed was, him. Let, let me check the score. I don't want to say it was a blowout. I, yeah, and I, I want to say it was Dobbs. I'm not sure, though. 28-16 in week three. And that was Dobbs for sure. Oh yeah, that was Dobbs for sure. Yeah, Dobbs was the starter, you know, the, this uh, past year until Kyler came back. Yeah, I forgot he was starting games for the Cardinals. That's man, he, yeah, because yeah, he was doing good for them, and then boom, he gets traded. Like right when Kyler got back, it was like, oh, enjoy the bench, and then a day later he got traded, like right before the deadline. It was like, oh, okay. Yeah, and then like, I feel like, you know, I've said it many times. He just runs so fearlessly. Like he is going to score, you know, he's looking only to run through the end zone, nothing else, not going to shake anybody out. Just 
you know, straight line, focus, tunnel vision. Um, and I feel like, I feel like his play kind of, you know, reflects his resiliency a little bit, but you know, let's get to some other 49er free agency updates. They haven't touched the running backs. Uh, haven't signed anybody yet. Uh, haven't touched the fullbacks. Um, they have, uh, re-signed Juwan Jennings. Juwan Jennings, uh, signed his, um, his tender, right? That's what it's called, right, Mike? Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, his restricted free agency tender and uh, is back on a one-year deal. I think it's, you know, around $4 million. Uh, Chris Conley also got extended one-year deal. And then so now the 49ers, I kind of took them off of the um, need depth at wide receiver because, you know, Chris Conley played in the Super Bowl. Ronnie Bell, you know, he was a rookie this past year, had had some flashes of of good and then had some flashes of like, oh my God, please get off of special teams. Um, but hopefully Ronnie Bell can improve. Danny Gray still has two years left on his rookie contract and we're still waiting to see if he's going to produce anything. The 49ers took him in, in the third round, I think in 2022. Um and I'm not expecting much out of Danny Gray. Like, I, like I wouldn't be shocked if he doesn't make the football team, you know, come August because, you know, the 49ers might take someone in the draft because, you know, maybe to hedge their bets if they're not able to retain Brandon Ayuk, you know, uh, going forward. But, um, you know, going on to tight end, the, the 49ers are still in the same position as the last time that, that we spoke about it. Um, they probably need to draft a tight end to compete with Cam Latu and Braden Willis for the tight end two spot. Um, and then for the offensive line, the only thing that's really changed is John Feliciano is now back on a one-year extension. Um, I think we went over the Colton McKivitz extension, you know, last time, but, um, uh, the 49ers have signed Brandon Parker to a one-year deal. Mike, what can you tell me about Brandon Parker? I can tell you that Raider fans did not like him, but it was in the sense of <laughs> uh, who can I relate this to? Like, I guess maybe Ronnie Bell, like the way you said, like get off of special teams, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's probably, probably not the best example. Um, maybe it doesn't matter. Basically, you never want to see a backup offensive tackle playing. That's just scary, you know? Mm -hmm. And he was a guy that was drafted in the third I round. Say, I want to say the third round. And it just felt like a weird pick at the time. And then he was just this big, you know, slow offensive tackle that just – you could see it in the preseason, like, quickly, like, oh, this guy is not a starter, you know? Mm -hmm. And then – it was like with Gruden every other year, it'd be like, oh, Brandon Parker's the penciled in right starting right tackle. And we're just sitting there like, oh my God. Oh no. <laughs> and then he tore his ACL. And then he comes back the next year and it's like, Brandon Parker's the penciled in starting right tackle. It's like, oh my God. Oh no. And then he tears his ACL. Will someone again. get him off the field? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when whenever the starting right tackle would get hurt it'd be brandon parker and i'd we'd all be sitting there like oh, here we go or in the in the preseason they would put him at left tackle and it was like can you can you see this john gruden can you can you watch the play because it's not good please don't ever put brandon parker at left tackle granted all that is very negative i think he's a fine backup he's fine i mean really what you want to do what you want the niners to do is draft a le or offensive tackle in the second round. That's what you should want the, the Niners to do. And then he could be the the swing tackle or third string or second string right tackle until the rookie Not gets gets ready. The Niners can draft someone in the first round too, Mike. They have a first round pick now. Oh, absolutely. I think if I were I mean me just looking at the the team and also considering like what is available at that 31st overall pick spot. 
your best bet is interior offensive line, offensive tackle, or defensive tackle. Like that's where I would expect the Niners to go. Mm-hmm. But I and yeah, if there's a if the right offensive tackle is there, absolutely. But I think you can find some like potential uh all pro offensive guards at that 31 spot. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I guess we'll just have to see like the way that the draft shakes out, but I'm still holding out hope that the 49ers can get a starting caliber right tackle at the end of the first round. So, yep. you know, maybe my hopes are a little too high up, but uh I tell you what, man, that Brandon Parker, man. Starting caliber yeah. player. And, I mean, I'm just looking at impression. the I'm looking at the contracts at your offensive line and you got your left and right guards with one year left. Your right tackle has two years left. You just signed that one year extension. And then Trent Williams has three years left, but do we really expect him to last all three years? I'm not sure. Uh huh. I think so. But dude, dude's yeah. making hella money. Why wouldn't he? Uh, yeah. If his body just decides, uh, but point being here, I'm not really hammering on Trent Williams. Uh, I would hope he's, you know, plays three more years, but give it a year and suddenly you're going to have a massive need at guard. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think that uh, the 49ers signing or re signing John Feliciano to an extension, I think, is. Um, I had said that I would want the 49ers to move Colton McKivitz to right guard. But now that they have Feliciano, I think that you could probably pencil him in, pencil him in as the starter if nobody gets drafted and like pushes him for the position. Uh, because I thought that, you know, he was an upgrade over Spencer Burford. And, you know, the Niners made like say what you want about the quality of these players, you know, at the starting position. But these five linemen, you know, took the 49ers to the Super Bowl. So I wouldn't be shocked if they just decided to run it back because, you know, knowing Kyle Shanahan, knowing uh, his reluctance to bolster the offensive line. Um, But I still think that the number one need right now is a starting right tackle because I think you can upgrade that and then, like, you know, you won't have to worry as much when you inevitably face off against Chris Jones again. You know, you're going to have help. And hopefully you can draft a badass. Like, you know, the Niners uh, several years ago when they traded away DeForest Buckner should have drafted Tristan Wirfs, you know, instead of Javon Kinlaw. Um, But the 49ers felt like they wanted to trade back with the Buccaneers, felt like they you know, it felt like the Bucks were not going to take a defensive tackle and that's, that's where their eyes were set. Or I wonder if they maybe thought the worst would be available, but, um, you know, revisionist history, right? Uh, I still think Colton McKivitz could slide in as the swing tackles, you know, as a swing tackle, if uh, the 49ers do draft that starter in round one, but I still have that penciled in as the number one need for this team, a starter at right tackle. Um, for, uh, another extension on the offense, Ben Barch, uh, was also extended. I anticipate he's going to be a practice squad player. Um, let's see. Um, the 49ers have signed Yatur Gross Matos. We might've talked about it last time, but I'm just going to go over it again. Um, they've signed Leonard Floyd. Like I said, probably talked about it last time. Good pass rusher. The 49ers have like Really, if you take a look at this defense, I felt like they, as soon as they decided that they were going to let go of Eric Armstead, uh, had glaring holes on the defensive line. And I feel like they have done a great job in, um, you know, uh, reloading a defensive tackle and uh, an edge rusher. I, I like Gross Matos. I like Leonard Floyd. I think Floyd is probably an upgrade over Chase Young. At least on pass, you know, on uh, you know, clear passing wrap, uh, passing downs, and uh, yeah, the 49ers are kind of not making big splashes in free agency, but they're signing solid players to build around the stars that they already have. So, 
Uh, that's kind of what I thought they were going to do. And I didn't think it was going to be smart to go after a guy like Daniil Hunter and then didn't just like completely neglect every other, you know, need and put all the chips into one basket because we already saw with the, the Javon Hargrave signing, it was, um, you know, they sort of did that and the depth around, you know, the depth on the defensive line, I think suffered as a result of it because they didn't re-sign a guy like Charles and Um, they, I mean, this was a couple of years ago, but, um, or at least I think it was a couple of years ago. They had a guy like Arden Key. You know, you can't afford to keep players like those around when you're paying, you know, not just one defensive tackle so much. They're still paying for Eric Armstead, um, but also Javon Hargrave, I think, you know, makes like 20, 25 million a year, like around there. Um, so the 49ers signed Malik Collins to a two year deal, Jordan Elliott to a two year deal, and have extended Kevin Givens. So they're bringing Kevin Givens back. Um, and then when we look at weak side linebacker, uh, they brought back Demetrius Flanagan Fowles. They signed special teamer Ezekiel Turner, uh, who I don't know if he'll, you know, really play much, um, you know, linebacker on defense, but he might be like an Oren Burks kind of player where he mainly plays special teams, but if somebody goes down, he might be forced to like, you know, be in the game. Um, and then the 49ers signed strong side linebacker, uh, Devondre Campbell, you know, who was on the Packers and I think made all pro just a couple years ago. Apparently he's not as good as he used to be, but Devondre Campbell is pretty adamant that he was in, you know, sort of, he was utilized incorrectly. So hopefully uh, Nick Sorensen and Brandon Staley can, you know, uh, utilize his skill set efficiently. Um, and then at corner, the 49ers have uh, signed Chase Lucas to a one year deal. I think he's more of a special teams player. And um, Isaac, oh God, I. The, the pronunciation, I thought the pronunciation was y, uh, y, hold on, Yadam. Uh, mm. I thought that earlier, but John Lynch spoke earlier, and, the, and then I think he pronounced it correctly. I think it's uh, Yadam. Or, might be Yadam. Um, so I apologize if I mispronounce that. You know, it's always a thing with me on this show with uh, pronunciations. Um, and then the 49ers have extended George Odom, who is more of a special teams player. Um, and I anticipate that Hofunga might be starting, but it's not a given. Um, and then Jair Brown can probably move back to, to free safety. But that's the updates for the extensions. Um, you know, the 49ers' biggest needs. Uh, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll go over that when we when we talk about the draft. Um uh, let's see. Uh, I've updated the list of free agents that they've lost. And then I've updated the list of free agents that they've resigned. And then they're still, you know, these are the free agents that are still remaining for the 49ers. Logan Ryan, Ter Terrence Mitchell, Mitchell. Sorry. I don't know what's going on with me today. Uh, Tayshawn Gibson, Randy Gregory, Ross Dwelly, Alfredo Gutierrez, Jason Verrett. And then, you know, the players they've resigned, I went over it. So, you know, it's all listed here. And then uh, the free agents that are leaving, I'll go over the ones from last time and then obviously add on the new ones. Uh, so Charlie Warner went to Atlanta, Kinlaw uh, with the Jets, Oliver also with the Jets, Sam Darnold uh, with Minnesota, Eric Armstead went to Jacksonville, I think signed for like $17 million per year, you know, big contract. Uh, took a pay cut technically, but is going to be making more of that paycheck because he's not going to be hit so harshly with California taxes, you know, it's kind of funny how we just kind of accept California taxes over here. Huh, Mike? It's like, you know, we always yeah. joke about it. It's like, you know, everybody's like, yeah, I don't make my whole paycheck over here, but like, not, you know, nobody ever like calls for it to change. Yes. Or at least the people that do, you know, their vote, like, like absolutely just gets buried in California every, you know, every election term. And I'm not saying taxes are 
are like bad and I don't want to make this a political thing, but I just think it's funny how it's like, you know, we all joke about it. Yeah. I, I would say my answer is politics are a tricky thing. Um, I could go on and on about that, but I'll sound <laughs> a certain way. Yeah. Mike was rooting for uh, the Axis powers in World War II. <laughs> no, not like that. It's just uh, American politics are just all over the place. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so Mike was actually rooting for America. Um, so Matt Pryor went to Chicago. Cleveland Farrell went to Washington. Ray Ray McLeod also went to Atlanta with Charlie Warner. Uh, I think they took a flight together and probably sat next to each other and held hands. Um, Chase Young went to New Orleans. Uh, Oren Burks went to Philadelphia. And Sebastian Joseph Day went to Tennessee. And now we can talk about uh, the 49ers' remaining needs in the draft. So, you know, I think that most of the free agency moves have kind of been, you know, made. The 49ers... As of right now, it seems like they have 50 out of their 53 total players who are going to make the opening day roster. Um, they, they carry 53 into the like the first week of the season, right, Mike? Like that's when the breakdown goes to 53, or is it into lower? The regular than season, that? yeah, into the regular season, yeah. Like the cutoff for the regular season is 53. Um, and then throughout the preseason, there's a few cuts, cutoffs. I don't know if I, they might have. Passed a rule this offseason. I'm not sure, though. They were trying to get a rule passed where there's only one, maybe two at the at the most, big cut days instead of, like, three or four, like, each week. Not three or four each week, but, you know, one per week, basically. They want to get it down to, like, one or two. So, like, you know, the, the backups can kind of stay on the roster up until the very last point to get their two cents in of being worth being kept, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but basically come the end of the draft. And then once all these, you know, uh, undrafted free agents are getting signed, we'll see teams get up to 90 man and then we'll eventually get to training camp and then boom, before you know it, it's preseason. And then we start getting the cut downs. And then as, as you said, uh, lead up to the week one of the regular season, cut down to 53. Mm hmm. Yeah, so uh, these are the draft picks that the 49ers are going to have. Uh, and then, you know, as we were just talking about, I think that the 49ers are only going to be looking for probably three more people who are they're going to actually carry into the, to the regular season. I don't see those being free agency players. I see them being three, you know, at least three of these draft players. And then obviously some of these guys might kick out a guy who's on the fence, like maybe Danny Gray or Cam Latu. Um, so, you know, the 49ers need to hit on at least half of these picks, um, at least to have solid depth, you know, at certain, you know, key positions. Um, but the Niners have pick 31 in round one. They've got pick 63 in round two. They got pick 94 in round three. Uh, pick 124 via Dallas in round four. Pick 132, which is a comp uh, compensatory pick in round four. Uh, pick 135 in round four. Um, 176, another compensatory uh, in round five. Another compensatory with 211 in round six. And 215 is their final compensatory pick in round six. And their final pick overall is 251 in round seven. And what I think that the 49ers should uh, focus on getting is they should get a starting right tackle. They probably need safety depth because outside of Hufunga and um, Jair Brown, I don't know if you can rely on George Odom long term to really fill in at safety. Um, but they definitely need to reload, you know, on the, on the back end of that defense. Um, you know, the, the 49ers need to add a linebacker because we don't know how Dre Greenlaw is going to be. Uh, Flanagan fouls may or may not be, a, you know, a startable linebacker come week one. So um, I don't, 
ha- like he's been on the team for a couple years now, but you know, I, I hear mixed things about Flanagan fouls and like, he's not a player that I've necessarily focused on, you know, when, when I watch the 49ers, there's just so much talent on defense that people get buried. And I don't think fouls was necessarily a starter. So, um, 49ers probably, uh, could look to replace him. I don't know if D winters could step in or, you know, most likely the 49ers are just going to end up drafting somebody. Um, at, at guard, um, Mike and I were talking about it earlier, how the Niners might get an interior offensive lineman towards the end of the first round because of the value there, uh, versus, um, you know, the amount of tackles that are still left. Uh, I think the 49ers could use a backup left guard or, you know, uh, even a starting right guard. Like if you can upgrade over Feliciano, I don't anticipate that they're going to prioritize it since they re-signed Feliciano, but, you know, uh, just something for for you to look at. Like, you know, if you're going to watch draft prospects, I would say these four and then uh, these remaining two also. Uh, running back, we've, you know, pretty much got it, uh, like taken care of, but running backs, you know, they, they're a dime a dozen. They, they go down all this, you know, all the time in the NFL. Um, if Elijah Mitchell can't stay healthy, Jordan Mason's going to step up, uh, you know, as the running back two role, McCaffrey's going to receive most of the workload. The Niners probably need at At least if you're not going to get, if you're not going to draft running backs, at least sign, you know, they should probably get two guys, you know, bring two guys in at least, um, you know, into training camp and then defensive end. Um, I did say that I like, uh, gross Matos and Leonard Floyd, but I think that you could probably bring in, you know, one or two more players to compete in camp. So, um, you know, you know what's one thing we didn't talk about on the show, Mike, and don't have scheduled as as a topic. What's that? The 49ers losing a draft pick. And oh yeah, I, yeah. Uh, so I'm 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 just going to talk about it briefly. It's old news now because it it came out like last week. But the 49ers had a clerical error, and they are going to be losing their draft pick next year, their fifth round pick. And um, this year, I think their uh, compens- one of their compensatory picks fell. I think it was their fourth round one. Um, it it fell to the back of like all the compensatory picks, or it might have been it might have been their pick. Yeah, their pick probably fell back behind all the compensatory picks. So that's why that's why one thirty five is behind their their comp pick. Because I think it goes all the team's picks, then it goes the comp picks. But I think they they punish the Niners by moving them behind that. So I I think I think today the um, the like error came out that they like it was more specific. You know, we 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 got more news today with the owners meetings. I think that they reported that they like. They were off by seventy five thousand on a player that they paid, and for that they're losing a draft pick. Yeah. So, uh, so far, uh, you know, with with Jed York being becoming the official owner, the first thing you should do is hire a brand new accountant. That should be the the first order is is top you know is, is top head honcho over at the 49ers. You have my seal of approval. Forget, forget a right tackle. Forget a right guard. With your first round pick, get an accountant who who will get it right. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's just so dumb with like little things like off the field, you know, uh, mm-hmm. like people who shouldn't have any business in affecting the football operation affects the football operation you know Mm -hmm. but you know businesses are businesses and you know mistakes happen and uh it is what it is mike are we ready to move on to the raiders yes we are 
hopefully the player that we're going to be talking about later in this video isn't ready to move on to the Raiders. Yeah. We'll see. Now let's get into it. Silver and black time. Mike, you have the floor. I'm going to pull up your spreadsheet, you know, for, for the Raiders free agency updates and, you know, beautiful. go ahead and uh, you probably want it up first before you start, huh? Yeah, might as well. We'll just get into quick updates on free agency and then move right into, uh, you know, what we should be looking for in the draft. All right. Raiders free agents. Got it up. Go ahead and zoom it in just a little. Just a smidge? Yeah, a little bit more. We can probably just go, yeah, that's good, so we can make sure everybody reads it. So, as you can see on the far left, you have the key. If the top where it says quarterback, running back, fullback, you got yellow, green, red, right? Yellow means the position needs a starter. Like, we have Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell at quarterback, right? But, in my opinion, for that position, especially quarterback, there needs to be a better starter above them. Um, at running back, you have a lot of bodies in there, but the the green on the top means that uh, I believe that position needs youth and or depth, technically both. It needs more depth, and I want it to be young. And perhaps that young depth can become the eventual starter. So that's what I mean when I see – when you see green, that means – Maybe they should draft somebody at that position, and someday they can become a starter. Were you going to say something? Uh, I just remembered that the Raiders signed Alexander Madison. And, all right, I feel like this is the perfect thing to bring up because this is, like, one of the reasons why we made this this show. You know, because either either I'm going to be wrong you know, dead wrong or what I'm going to say is going to age well. Uh, but I don't think Alexander Madison is that great of a signing, you know, for the Raiders running back room. I feel like he's more of uh, like he's okay at best. I, I don't, I don't see him as like a viable player to take over for Zamir White. If Zamir White was to go down. I see. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, again, with the, the green for the running back position, I feel that they need to draft a, a running back this year. Um, and, I mean, there's a lot of green, so it's you, you wouldn't expect the team to draft. A running back, wide receiver, left guard, center, D tackle, nose tackle, right defensive end, inside linebacker. Weak side, you know, like, they're not going to draft all of those, but running back specifically is one of the positions that I will get back into and ex, you know explain we need to draft a I mean I'll I'll just running back I'll just explain it now I agree that I don't feel confident if Alexander Madison is the guy taking over if Zamir White went down for like 2 weeks I wouldn't feel confident with that mm -hmm. granted I like the signing because the Vikings felt that he could be their starter uh oh, Dalvin Cook's out of here Alexander Madison is the guy and then they also had Cam Akers but that didn't work out I think that Alexander Madison is best fit as the second, if not third, running back. Sort of a you kind. Of, we kind of joke about this on the phone. Not a one-two punch, but a two-three punch. You know, I think he's no, no, a good no. guy to bring in there. We were not talking about Alexander Madison when when we were talking about the two-three punch. We were talking about DeAndre Washington and Jalen Richard um, back in 2016. Yes. Uh, they were a great 2-3 punch. Now, yeah, I will say Alexander Madison, I think, definitely is better than Sincere McCormick, Britton Brown, Tyreek McAllister. Those those guys I, I've i never even heard of. I've at least heard of Alexander Madison. So, you know, I'm not just going to say Alexander Madison is the worst running back in this room, but they gave him an opportunity in Minnesota to you know, to take over for Dalvin cook and maybe the offensive line wasn't great, but I don't think the Madison really took advantage of opportunities that he was given. Um, and I think that you mentioned that he was a change of pace back. Right. Yeah. And then I sent you that stat about like, you know, his goal line carries 
And I was like, I was like, it would appear as though he is a change of possession back, you know, because he wasn't necessarily that efficient near the goal, near the goal line. And like you said, most of it is blocking. I agree. Um, but I just, you know, I, I would watch, uh, some, I would watch some like fantasy football shows. And there was a, there was this guy and Andrew Erickson of the, uh, of the fantasy pros, he was like all off season saying, you know, I'm not drafting uh, Alexander Madison. I don't think he's that good. He's like, mm. I just don't think he's a good player. Right. And then Madison had like lackluster fantasy production. And I know that doesn't translate to like real life football production, but I'm just like, I thought Madison was going to be like the next Alvin cook. Like he was going to be alone in that backfield and get it all. And then just, there was a huge drop off from like what Dalvin cook was doing. Yeah. Even though they were like pass heavy, you know, under Kirk cousins, huge Hmm. drop off, you know, from Madison. Yeah. I, uh, I'm actually changing linebacker right there. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I don't, I like the Alexander Madison, Madison signing. I think he's not going to be your goal line back ever. Um, the Vikings were pitted into that because whether it was Cam Akers got hurt or Cam Akers sucked or just because they got rid of Dalvin cook, they were forced into Alexander Madison rushing the ball within the five yard line. And that's not what he should be doing. And I think this Raiders team is built to uh, give the football to their money makers on the goal line. They could throw a fade to Devontae Adams. They could throw a a quick little slant to Jacoby Myers. Or better yet, you can have Zamir Wright run the ball because he's a bigger back than Alexander Madison. Unless our new offensive coordinator, Luke Getze, is an idiot, I don't foresee Madison getting very many goal line touches, especially not on third and goal. You know, I think as a situational change of pace back to give Zemir White some time to, you know, get a couple plays off. Perhaps we have a rookie in there as well. I think things will be good at the running back position. It sucks we don't have Jacobs. It'll be different, but I think it's fine. Um, And I think this is what the offense was always going to be. Uh, Joel also chimes in on on Madison. Uh, Joel as a Raider fan also doesn't think that Madison is that good since he had zero rushing touchdowns. Uh, he'll be a third down back uh, because he can catch. And I think that's what Mike, you know, told me privately too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I like him as a change of change of pace slash receiving back for the Raiders. Amir Abdullah has got a receiving back sort of build as well. I can tell you Madison's better than him. You know, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Amir Abdullah at 31 is better than Alexander Madison. At, I'm pretty sure he's 25 years old. But uh, we will see. Um, so, yes, we have signed Alexander Madison. Obviously, we went over Gardner Mitchell before. Fullback remains just empty. The one empty position on the, on the roster right now. Uh, and that's why it is red, which means that it needs a starter and depth, even though really fullback, you're only going to carry one on the roster, but preseason, you're going to want two, you know, you're going to want a battle there. So I'm keeping it red just because I think it needs at least two guys there. And there's guys, literally nothing. Did you guys have a fullback last year? Yeah. Jacob Johnson in the red on the bottom, everybody that's in red or yellow underneath the gray line is a current free agent. And in the yellow, you can see restricted free agent. In the darker, well, not darker, but red, they are unrestricted free agents. So Brandon Bolden, Jacob Johnson, DeAndre Carter, Jesper Horstead, those are guys that are that remain unsigned on, in free agency. And they are coming off of playing for the Raiders. Uh, wide receiver, there's been no pickups as of yet, no signings, um, nothing new to report there. I, I would expect them yeah. to, if not... Yeah, no, I mean, wide receiver usually is going to be the deepest position in the in the preseason and training camp. Usually you're going to have at least like eight guys. So uh, 
Yeah, I expect them to probably draft one later in the draft and uh, definitely sign somebody at some point here in free agency. Maybe even after the draft, for all I know. Um, and then at tight I'm end... have to even trade for somebody. If... Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, at tight end, the Raiders did sign Harrison Bryant. He was a guy that I name-dropped uh, last time on the pod. Um, as an option at tight end. And I think this is a good moment to kind of go over free agency as a whole. Like, okay, the Raiders signed Christian Wilkins. The Raiders signed Gardner Minshew, right? Those are big signings, specifically in the financial aspect. Like, Gardner Minshew isn't really a big signing, but it's a big help, in my opinion. And it's a big uh, security blanket in case they can't get the quarterback in the draft. Christian Wilkins, okay? This, This is the way I feel about free agency. You should not build your team through free agency. The Tennessee Titans right now, they are building their team through free agency. They they made a good hell of a trade with the Chiefs the other night for Legereus Need. Otherwise, their free agency is fragile. Like, you're signing uh, Calvin Ridley to a four-year $90 million deal. You're insane. He's 29 years old. You're insane. I want um, you to clarify when you say you don't think that you should build your team through free agency. <clears throat> Are you talking about build your depth or build your star, you know, your star players? Your star players. Now, but let me let me further clarify. There are there are players that make free agency, and then there are players that shouldn't make free agency. If you can get one of those guys that shouldn't make free agency, you sign them. That's Christian Wilkins. He should not have made free agency, but the Dolphins had cap space issues. That's a franchise player. He should have been franchise tagged. When a franchise player doesn't get franchise tagged because their team doesn't have the money to get them, or because they had two guys coming up on under, you know, on free agency, and they like say Baker Mayfield and uh, the safety for the bu- the Buccaneers. Uh, forgetting his name, he put the peace sign on Tyree Kill in the Super Bowl. Forgetting his Winfield. name. Yes, Antoine Wilfield Jr. Both of them are coming up on free agency, and the Buccaneers are sitting there like, we have to sign both of them. Let's just say they franchise tag Winfield, but they don't get to re-sign Baker Mayfield before the free agency window opens. Baker's good as gone because he shouldn't be a free agent, right? Same would go for Winfield if they did it vice versa. So the Dolphins, they allow Christian Wilkins to go, sign him. Absolutely sign him because he's a star player. He's a he's a franchise guy. Those are guys that you can build on. But Cra- Calvin Ridley, no, no. Other than Christian Wilkins and those star players that make free agency, the players that you should sign are essentially depth pieces, like very, um, like very specific bits to your team that you can get for cheap. Harrison Bryant is one of those guys. You could argue Alexander Madison, Gardner Minshew, John Jenkins, Adam Butler. Those guys, you know, are those guys that they're not going to break your bank and they're going to fill a specific need for your team the following season. Uh, So Harrison Bryant, they bring in, he is the number two tight end. He's going to be, you know, he can catch passes, but he's also a pretty, pretty darn good blocker. And I, that's something that I felt the Raiders really needed at tight end because you have the rookie, Michael Mayer, coming into his second year. He's not the best at blocking in the world. He's still young. He's still learning. He's going to be a stud, I think, but I think you needed to bring in a veteran that can come in and block, and I don't think Austin Hooper was that guy. So Harrison Bryant was a guy that I just – as far as a, a tool player, like a, a specific – uh, job needed on the offense. Blocking tight end was one of them. They got Harrison Bryant. That feels great. Left tackle, nothing to report. Left guard. Um, honestly, the offensive line is just really interesting right now. Um, you know, I mentioned guys that you shouldn't allow to get to free agency. I think Andre James is probably one of those guys. He's still 25, I think, or 26. Like 26 year old starters. If they make free agency, they're just going to go break the bank somewhere, you know? So getting to re-sign Andre James at the rate that they did compared to these offensive guards 
getting signed for twenty million a year. It just felt good. Um, Jordan Meredith, he's a restricted free agent. He hasn't signed his tender, but he has been tendered. So I have him slotted in at right guard, but realistically, he'll be the backup left guard and right guard. That's what he was last year. Um, just a good, flexible guy. Um, ben Brown, future contract. Question. The little R. Okay, the little okay. R there basically means if he does sign his tender, that means that next year he will be restricted as well. Mm, okay. I might so on have these- last time, I might have erased an R. Mm. on somebody because i thought it was a typo yeah i'm not sure so, but i so far yeah. it looks good to me so double check like the the players who were tendered yes um so yeah again jordan meredith meredith is in orange right now because he hasn't officially been signed unlike isaiah pull at the bottom he was tendered and he also signed so he's in green um and the last interesting thing about the offensive line, other than Greg Van Roten still being out there at right guard, uh, Tom Telesco, the GM, was on a like a Raiders YouTube video, kind of recapping free agency a little bit, talking with a couple of the you know Raider podcast guys, and he kind of went out of his way to mention that Thayer Mumford will probably be looked at not only at right tackle but also right guard. And I felt that Thayer Mumford came in and played pretty well off the bench at right tackle. The Raiders' offense is changing their scheme. I want to say, don't quote me here, but I want to say from like more of a power to a wide zone. Mm-hmm. Joel says that uh, he thinks Meredith is going to start at right guard because he looked really good when he came in last year. He did look good. And I, I really am glad that he was a restricted free agent because getting to keep him feels massive. Um, it you know if if he is worthy of the shot, I'm not opposed to it. I just think I'd rather have him as the depth and have a true starter there. Not to say that he's not a true starter. Just if they can keep him as their depth guy, in case a Dylan Parham or whoever the right guard starter goes down that feels safer to me than, okay, uh, Dylan Parham went down. Now we got to move Meredith from starting right guard to starting left guard. we got to move Thayer Mumford to right guard. And then Dalton Wagner's our, our starting right tackle, or our rookie is our starting right tackle. Like, it just – I hate jumbling up multiple positions at once. I'd rather have the backup ready to go at two positions. Also, DJ Fluker is a super interesting guy. I know he's slotted at left tackle right now, but he might be a backup right guard. If he even makes the team, I have no idea. He's like 33, but uh, no, I Meredith is interesting. And that that's going to be a guy to look out for in uh training camp and preseason for sure. I, I think there will definitely be a position battle at either, if not both right guard and right tackle this off season. Um, but again, Thayer Munford, according to Tom Telesco, the GM is going to be looked at at right tackle and right guard. So, I mean, the battle could be Mumford and Meredith. I, maybe that's the battle, and I'm I'm honestly fine with that. If, if he's slotted in at right guard and you draft the right tackle with the 13th or 44th pick, that, that would probably work for me, you know? I think the defense is pretty close here. It's just, you know, looking at this right now, clearly corner is a big need. Can they get that guy at some point in the offseason? I would assume they will. Will it be the draft? Will it be free agency? We'll see. Um, can you bring it down to left defensive end where Max Crosby is? I got left defensive end in blue, meaning that they have or it has no immediate need. I would I would say they can draft some depth there. Um, I just put blue there because Max Crosby is there. Like, he's going to play every snap, you know. Uh, apparently, Janarius Robinson isn't going to get cut, even though he had a little, uh, I'm going to call it running with the law, you know. Uh, and then at right defensive end, you got Malcolm Kuntz and Tyree Wilson. Like, Tyree Wilson as your third defensive end is pretty damn good, you know. Was Robinson the one who got a DUI? Yeah, yeah. Dude. 
like these these players are not learning. You know, look at what happened with rugs. Rugs should yeah. have been like the last one. Rugs should have been like, all right, you know, no matter where you are, like you know, I'm I'm saying like I'm kind of overgeneralizing the Las Vegas players because like, you know, Las Vegas is Las Vegas, but like, dude, that ended horribly. That should have yeah. been like the wake up call. Like, all right, let's take it seriously. Not, not drink and drive. My yeah. goodness. Yeah, I'm not gonna make any excuses for these guys. I mean, they got all the money in the world. I mean, not all of them, but you know, they they do have money to spend on Uber. You know. Yeah. Or they have a phone to call a friend. Hey, man, I'm fucked up. Can you pick me up? Like, it's really that easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Yeah. No, it's unfortunate, but I. Again, I, yeah, I'm not going to make Let this excuses. be a lesson to everybody at home. If you know that you're going to be out drinking, let let somebody know that you're going out drinking first. So that way you can schedule a ride or let just so, have somebody knowing that like you're going to be somewhere and you might not be coherent later to get a ride. Yep. You know, have somebody just know where you're at. Doesn't matter if you're a football player or not, just as an adult. Make make that a habit. Makes everything so much easier. Yeah. Um, defensive tackle. Clearly, they signed Christian Wilkins. You got Adam Butler, who they re-signed, and I feel fantastic about. That was a guy. Multiple podcasts ago, I was saying, hey, as far as players that the Raiders can re-sign, upcoming free agents, he may have been at the top of my list for must re-sign. Um, I didn't know for a fact that Christian Wilkins was going to be sitting, you know, above him on the depth chart, but having Adam Butler in that rotation for the past rushing defensive tackles, or even to come in on nose, you know, it, he's a good defensive tackle to have. And then behind them, you have Byron Young and Matthew Butler, two young guys that were drafted recently. Um, hopefully Byron Young can develop. He's still got three years under contract. If he can take a big stride this year, that'd be, that'd be Amazing, really. Um, John Jenkins at nose tackle also just recently re-signed. I feel great about that too. He for a 34-year-old, I think, he had a hell of a season. You know, run stopping, tackles for loss, really all that. You got Nesta Jade Silvera and Marquan McCall also at nose tackle. Uh again, right defensive John, end. John Jenkins was so good that he made the the uh video intro you know we, yes, we just did. like updated it so yeah we had to take guys peep that we had to take josh jacobs out of it so you know i wanted to get a good malcolm coons play and i i think my favorite coons play last season was the force fumble on that Chargers quarterback uh eastern stick yeah where <laughs> like the pressure was coming up from the right side meanwhile on the left end well the right end, but on the on the left tackle, Kuntz took a really wide angle and just comes around. And right as Easton Stick like tries to get back from pressure, he just gets plowed from behind by Kuntz and he just drops the ball. And Pause. then John Jenkins picks him up. Yeah, and then John Jenkins uh, picks up the ball and runs it however many yards for a touchdown with Max Crosby. Um, and then like two players later, you get your big pick six from uh, Jack Jones with the one handed catch so yeah that game was game. amazing that game was awesome um yeah but right defensive end you got two i mean malcolm coons i can't say enough about him and then tyree wilson hopefully he again uh along with byron young hopefully really tyree wilson takes a massive leap this year i felt like he was coming on in the past couple games uh at the end of last season so hopefully give it an off season hanging around Max Crosby and Malcolm Koontz and all those guys a lot more this offseason. Um, he could take a massive step. Um, I Can you scroll to the right? Yeah, there's there's really nothing else to report other than Isaiah Polamau signing his uh, restricted free agent tender to re-sign with the team for one more year. Um, so I'll just kind of go by need, really. I mean... I really don't think linebacker is a need. I know every Raider fan and their mom is saying the Raiders need to draft a linebacker. 
The only reason I agree is because the three top linebackers on this roster all have one year left on their deals. Granted, Luke Masterson is a restricted deal, so he'll probably be back after next season. Um, and honestly, in my opinion, I think one of, if not both, Robert Splane and Divine Diablo will be re-signed. It really depends on how they play this year or if one or both of them get re-signed before the season starts. Because, something to remember, uh, the Raiders currently have around $26 million in cap space. They're going to get another, I think, like 20 maybe $23 million post-June 1st. So at that point, they can re-sign players if they want. They can extend players. They can do whatever they want because they're going to have money to spend and not as many players to put it on, you know, on the market. So that might be the time to re-sign guys before the season starts, like a Malcolm Koontz, Robert Spillane, Divine Diablo, Trevon Merrick, Nate Hobbs, Marcus Epps. It's a lot of guys on defense that only have one year left in their deal. So... But if they're not going to resign one of those guys, they should probably draft a guy at that position. I like Amari Bernie from what I saw last year in the preseason. Saw a pass defending linebacker, but you know he's going to need to take some steps to become a starter. I think. Um, and then you know at corner you have the glaring red position. It's really just that we need a starter opposite Jack Jones. I think Faison is fine as a third. I prefer him as a fourth, but as a third corner, he's fine. Um, and then you have Jacorian Bennett, the young guy who I thought last year might have became something really quick, but you know, kind of dwindled down to a special teamer. Hopefully he could stick take a big step this offseason and show out in the preseason. But whether it's free seat uh, free agency or the draft, or preferably both, the Raiders need to get that second corner in their opposite Jack Jones. And then their defense is pretty well set. And so- then safety. I don't know much about Chris Smith. I've never noticed him on the field. No offense to him. Um, I would, depending on what round, I would probably draft another free safety. But realistically, I think prioritizing re-signing Trevon Merrick might be a thing. You know, pretty soon here at free safety. Mm. So my question for you is, where do the Raiders go in the draft? Like, what are their remaining needs? Uh, you can zoom out and scroll to the right a little bit. We can get into that. You said zoom out? Yeah. Is it, is it too small? Should I zoom back in? No, that should be good. Just go up a little bit more. Yep. So right there in the red positions in need. I mean, to the right, you could see uh, – actually, you're perfect where you are. Obviously, where we on far right, you have who we released. In the green is who we signed. Lost in the red is players that we've lost, like – uh, Luminor to the Giants. Meek Robertson went to the Lions, unfortunately. Good luck to him. Austin Hooper. I don't know. And I oh, I think maybe New England. I, I really don't care. Brandon Parker went to San Francisco, and then Tyler Hall went to the Eagles. Backup corner. And then some fragments of interest. If you want to read them, there's some guys still out there, specifically at offensive line and corner. A lot of guys still left. Um especially at corner as far as like potential starters. Uh, but as far as positions of need um, for this upcoming draft, number one is quarterback. I mean, if we can get our quarterback of the future, uh, that would just be, that would be the biggest win of all for this franchise. Um, especially if he's the correct quarterback, right? Um Right guard, right tackle, I kind of would bunch them together because the whole Thayer Munford thing is kind of throwing a little pebble and what may or may not be the bigger need. You can you can slide Thayer Munford to right guard, and suddenly we might not even have a need at right guard if you tack on Jordan Meredith, like Joel said. So, And then running back, um, I, I fully expect the Raiders to draft a running back. Like of all those green uh, – green colored positions on you know to the left um running back is probably the main one that i'm like you have to draft somebody i would probably draft another defensive tackle i would draft another wide receiver i might even draft another guard but other than that like linebacker defensive end safety you don't need to 
you need to draft a corner. You need to draft a quarterback. And so on. Sorry. Uh, I agree. Right um, I agree in terms of the fact that they should be drafting a running back. I would feel so much better to have Alexander Madison as the third string running back instead of, yep. you know, the first guy that's going to come in in case anything happens to White. Yeah. And honestly, if you can get, uh, you know, a running back with speed, you know, then you can have Zamir White as kind of your power back. Uh, Alexander Madison could be like a change of pace sort of guy. And then you can have this speedy running back that can really get some big gains, you know, for the offense. Um, and then at, at defense, obviously corner, I think, is the biggest need. It's really the main need that has a, a opening as far as the starting defense goes, the starting 11. Um, they were talking to Trava- Tredavious White last Monday. They had him in the building. He was scheduled to get a bunch of other visits, so I wouldn't be shocked if he signed somewhere soon. I think White would be a great pickup. Uh, specifically, I think getting a veteran in the cornerback room would be great, and then you can draft uh, you know, another corner that could potentially start. You know, Even with that 13th pick, a corner might be the way they go. I don't know yet. I think with how good the pass rush should be, I don't think going corner is really the – I don't know if that's the right way to go about it. I might say corner in the third round might make more sense to me. And the the whole, like, what could really throw a wrench in the entire, oh, what should they pick at which round plan is there's still that very minute possibility that the Raiders might trade up to third, fourth, fifth overall and take the quarterback of the future. It's still out there. I the the Vikings traded up with the Texans from the second round to the first. They got the twenty third pick, so now they have the eleventh and twenty third. It feels very much like the Vikings are gearing up and aiming their sights for a top three to five pick to get their quarterback. Um, and that's going to be very hard to uh, to go against for the Raiders because they don't have two first round picks this year. They only have this year's, next year's, and the following years. Are they going to do it like the Niners and? Give three straight first round picks to get up to the top three to five. Horrible. Gonna hurt if they do. That's gonna hurt if they do. Horrible. Man. You have to get it right though. I mean, if the Bills give up three first round picks to get Josh Allen, was it worth it? You might argue no because they haven't won a Super Bowl, but also every year it feels like they have a chance to win the Super Bowl because of him. Didn't you they know? give up like a first and in two seconds? I honestly couldn't tell you what they gave up. I just know that they came up to like what seventh overall. Hold on. Josh Allen trade. Go go on and then and then I'll I'll bring it back up. Okay. Well, it basically just trading up for a quarterback can kind of stick a fork in all of this. Like I think the running back, you're gonna draft him between the third to fifth round if you're gonna want a guy that's really gonna make a difference on this offense. Um there's no like top end running backs in this class, but you can find the right guy for your system. I'm sure you can. I think honestly, the, these draft experts are talking down the running back position this year. I think there's a lot of guys. There's just no high end B. John Robertson, Brees Hall, you know, Saquon Barkley in this draft. And that's fine. But there's a lot of guys that might be the next DeAndre Swift, the next uh, Austin Eckler, right? Maybe the next, oh, uh, maybe Elijah like Mitchell. White, Elijah Mitchell. Just those guys that can come in and make a difference, you know? Yeah. Uh, maybe the next uh, David Montgomery, mm-hmm. you know? And then, like, not- if if the Raiders are seriously not getting running back, you know, production out of the guys that they, like, currently have, and you pair that with, like, let's just say these rookies suck, the Raiders can always trade for a running back and it'll be probably not that expensive. Like McCaffrey was like a two and a three and that's like the best running back in the NFL or like top three. 
Um, so just, just to, uh, update during the 2018 NFL draft, the bills were sitting with the number 12 pick and in need of a passer. Uh, that's when they swapped first round picks with the Buccaneers, as well as sending Tampa Bay, a pair of second round picks for the chance to move up five spots and draft Josh Allen. Five, five spots is expensive, Mike. Imagine moving from where are the Raiders at? Seventeen right now. Uh, thirteen. Actually, you can 13. you can scroll down on the on the thing. It, sh- it shows all the draft picks the Raiders have. Oh, perfect. And I also just updated the the uh, positions of need. So it highlighted in red, I'd say are the top needs on the spreadsheet. Hmm. You're still highlighting right guard, even though you said what you said about like maybe Mumford might be uh, sliding in at right guard. And then you guys still have um, uh, what's his name? Uh, You know, Meredith. Yeah. Let me or put it on the screen. The depth chart. Yeah. Oh, Oh my God! I thought you were looking. I, no, I didn't no. know that. Yeah, I didn't know I'm you didn't see it. No, yeah. I for thought you meant like put the depth chart on the. I slid this way. That's why. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So first off, go. Yeah. So first off, going back up just a little bit to the top for positions of need. I changed the order. Right tackle is above right guard, but in red are positions that I think need to be drafted. So quarterback right tackle, right guard, corner, need to be drafted as of today, as of the roster that I have on paper. Um, But with that little pebble of Thayer Mufford might be right guard, I have right tackle above right guard, you know? And also, you know, if we were sitting at 13th overall and it's like, all right, the pick is in, what are you hoping for? If it's not the quarterback, for me, it's either right tackle or corner. There's no other position that I'm hoping for other than right tackle corner or, of course, the quarterback. But I'm not expecting the quarterback to be there at 13 or the quarterback of value to be there at 13. Granted, I will admit, there's a lot of steam growing or flowing or whatever you want to call it of Michael Penix being drafted at 13th overall by the Raiders. Am I against it? No, I'm really not. I I think that he has all the potential in the world. Um, There's just this fear that because he's already 24, is he closer to his ceiling, uh, you know, as an aging rookie, you know, because he spent six years in college. Is he close to his ceiling? I, that's hard to say. I mean, he hasn't been coached by, you know, NFL coaches yet. And really, I think, depending on what kind of quarterback you're looking for, like, okay, at the top of the draft, you're expecting the franchise-changing, you know, game-changing quarterback, you know. So um, Caleb Williams is expected to come in and just change the Bears. Uh, may I, may I like, give my opinion or, like, my take on Michael Penix? Okay, so the way I feel about Michael Penix, like, you know, I'm kind of I'm kind of mixed on him because I don't know what to expect. Like going going into the national championship game, I didn't watch a lot of college football, but I wanted to watch, you know, the national championship game because it was, you know, Jim Harbaugh. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Jim Harbaugh fan because of his background with the 49ers. Obviously, if you if you watch this podcast, we've we've talked about him probably more times than Mike would would uh, would think that we needed to. Um, but so I wasn't impressed by I, I think Penix Jr. played in that national championship game, right? I think he was the he's a quarterback of Washington. Correct. Okay, so I thought that there were opportunities, you know, for him to make passes that you know could have changed the game. You know, at at certain points in the game, he missed those opportunities. And, you know, that's just one game. 
come the NFL Combine, I'm I'm looking at him throw, and I think there's just something about left-handed quarterbacks that just like looks odd to me. Um, their mechanics look like uh, very like I don't know they they just don't look like tight. But then as soon as you flip it to the right-handed, it looks perfect. It's so weird. So, like, his mechanics are fine. It just looks weird to me, right? right. And who am I, right? But if you're picking him with the 13th overall pick and not having to move up for him, I think that's probably better than moving up for a guy that might not even work out. Because, like, what I wish the 49ers would have done a couple years ago was just sit Taking Mac Jones, who doesn't have that much higher of a ceiling, just like how you say you question if Michael Penix Jr.'s ceiling is like, you know, already kind of being met because he's 24. It's better to just stay there than to mortgage up all this draft capital on a guy that might not work out anyway, because you set the franchise back so long. Yeah. So, it's also in- yeah, I... I don't think it's a bad pick, you know, the 13th overall pick and you get a quarterback, you don't have to worry about it. Rookie contract. You still have Garner Minshew. If that doesn't like, if, if like uh Penix jr. Just sucks in the NFL, which I don't think he would just outright suck, but just in case that he did, you know, it's, you didn't, you only gave up one pick. Yeah. Yeah. I think as far as the capital spent, like that's the plus about Michael Penix to me. There's there's a whole bunch of ways I could go on a tangent with this conversation because the NFL draft is so interesting. Like the media members could be saying, like, oh, Michael Penix could be a second round pick. Yeah, that could be all of the GMs. Half the GMs saying, yeah, he should be a second round pick. And then half of them saying, oh, yeah, he should be a second round pick. Wink, wink, because actually they want him with the sixth pick, the eighth pick, the 13th, 11th, 12th pick. Just because the media says, oh, he's going to be a second round pick doesn't mean that he's a second round pick in every team's eyes. Just because the Raiders pick him at 13 and then the media comes out and says, wow, they really reached. Doesn't mean that they actually did, because two picks later could have been the Steelers saying, fuck. You know what I mean? Well, I'll say this. He could be like maybe not at the, at the same caliber as the other quarterbacks in the draft like that are going to be taken in the first round. Like he could just be like, you know, the talent the talent difference or like, you know, the the draft profile on this player is just like clearly a step down from the other guys. But there's, you know, there's a lot of demand for young quarterbacks, you know, especially in this year's draft, like the Patriots need a guy, the commanders need a guy. Um, the bears are probably, you know, the bears traded away Justin Fields. If they don't take a quarterback, this is going to be like the, the craziest draft pick of all time. If they don't. Um, so the bears are going to take a guy Vikings are probably going to take a guy, you know, it's probably going to trade up for a guy. Yeah, I mean, who would take a quarterback if, you know, like we're naming we're naming these teams, right? I feel like other teams are kind of set at their position. So it could be like, you know, teams that are just not in the market at looking for a quarterback might just be, um, you know, saying, well, I kind of feel like he's a second round grade. You know what I mean? But anonymously saying that, you know, but like right. you said, it could be somebody just like, wanting to wreak havoc on like the draft and it's like you know mind games with other teams yeah i mean i think that if a team is is dead set on all right as of today like this is our guy and the media asks them like hey can can you give me any you know tidbits for the draft they are going to give some honesty and they're going to tank their favorite players draft stock you know Right now, this might not correlate, but right now, suddenly uh, the bet for J.J. McCarthy to go second overall to Washington skyrocketed just over the past day because suddenly there's there's whispers and rumors and talk that 
the the Washington Commanders GM really likes JJ McCarthy and he might be their pick at second overall. When like a month or two ago, people were saying he should probably be a second round pick. And remember, McCarthy like reminds two me or of th- Zach Wilson. Yeah. Remember like two or three years ago when Malik Willis was going to be the first overall pick or like second overall pick for like a day. Mm-hmm. He ended up being a third round pick. Like, I don't know what it is with quarterbacks, but the media versus NFL teams on quarterbacks is completely out of whack, at least lately, you know? And maybe that's why all these mocks are like, oh, picks one through four are going to be quarterbacks. It's just like the value for quarterbacks has just like gone crazy lately. Yeah, not even Malik Uh, Willis, but uh, Will Levis was like going to be a first round pick and then, you know, Want the the second day? Second round, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I so really, I just I have no idea what to expect at quarterback, but um, I fully expect the Vikings to trade up because I think if they don't, like, they're that one team right now on paper that's just like you can't start that guy. I'm sorry, Sam Darnold cannot be their day one starter. He can be if you have a rookie beneath him, but they should have a rookie competing with him in free or in the off season. And that rookie should beat him out come day one, you know, because that's who Stan, Sam Darnold is now. Like, I'm sorry, no offense. Just yeah. the Vikings would be ridiculous for doing that while Justin Jefferson is trying to negotiate a contract. He's going to either ask for $40 million a year or ask to fucking trade him. So Joel says uh, Penix is his guy at 13. I'm just saying. And I'm I'm here for it. Like every like every year, I kind of come into the with to the pick. Like, all right, I want this guy, this guy, or this guy. And right now, for me, it's it's Talis Fuaga, Michael Penix, and Quinion Mitchell. The corner. Joel also says exactly. Josh Penix isn't the perfect prospect, but to not give up anything uh, to move up is a W. Yep, especially for a quarterback, dude. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It I mean it's huge because if you don't nail the pick, you can draft a guy the following year or the year after that. It's what the Cardinals did when they 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 literally drafted Josh Rosen and then like the following year they drafted Kyler Murray number 1 overall. Like yeah. if you trade up all all the chips in the basket for one guy, you know, and then you don't have picks later on, it's most likely going to bite you in the ass. Most yep. likely. So. Yeah. And that I think if they were to go Michael Penix at 13, you have offensive tackle and cornerback and right guard and running back options from the second round down. You know, it's not the end all be all like, oh, fuck, we missed out on the top end offensive tackles. It's like, hey, dude, we got a quarterback. And if he works out that offensive tackle that's sitting there, it does not matter compared to Michael Penix. So my last thing I'll say right now about Michael Penix, uh, he's been playing in a pro-style offense. So perhaps the transition to the NFL won't be as drastic as it would be for some other quarterbacks, you know? Um, And the, I mean, the big, the big falter with him from the media perspective is like, oh, he has an injury history and he has injury scares. Like this, this will scare off teams. Like we've seen guys come off of two ACLs and play fine. Michael Bush at running back, Frank Gore, right? Like, why should I be afraid of my quarterback having ACL is- issues? Like, I mean, first off, it's not an ACL issue; it's ACL in history. But like, he played. F- Foley last season and he looked good. He looked damn good. I know he didn't look good in the championship, but if you put up the tape against Texas, he probably looked damn good. I, I was listening to a podcast. I think it was uh I think it was Move the Move the Sticks with uh Daniel Jeremiah and Bucky Brooks. And they were like, you know, if if he ended his season, oh, if the Texas game was the national championship instead of the Michigan game, he'd be talked about being in the top five right now. Like that's how weird the quarterback, you know, media is towards these guys. So I, I just think that the Michigan game, like, really, like, hurt. 
You know, it there were there were like throws that were like wide open that he was missing. Like I yeah. said, it's a bad game. It happens sometimes. It, Brock it's Purdy, also entire... Brock Purdy had a bad game against the Ravens. Like it, you know, it just yeah. happens. It happens. And honestly, it's easy to blame the guy. It's also it well, it's not as easy to to come to your not come to your senses, but to think, well, it could have been the game planning. It could have been that Michigan just had the perfect game plan and really mess with their passing offense. You never know. I also do know that he got injured at some point with a rib injury in that game. I don't know when, but I could tell when I saw the end of that game that he was like not looking good physically, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, This is actually the last thing I'll say about him. The one concern that I have with Penix that I have heard from a couple people is if you draft a left-handed quarterback, your scheme completely flips which I never considered before. Um, so, you know, if these if this offense is coming into, I guess, the draft this offseason thinking, okay, we got these two right-handed quarterbacks, uh, Minshew and O'Connell, and this is how we're going to run it. And then our general manager drafts a left-handed quarterback. It's like, well, our offense actually kind of, like, has to flip a bit. And also, y- your blindside protector is now the right tackle. So, like, my opinion has been the perfect scenario is Talis Hufaga, Fuaga 13, Michael Penix 44. You can scroll down and see all the draft picks, by the way. But if you if that's not possible, you have to take Penix when you can, you know. Mm-hmm. But, uh, man, I mean, getting the blindside protector for him at 13 and then drafting him at 44, like, how about that for a value deal, you know? But I don't yeah. know. So here's what I'll say about the scheme, you know, part of it. Uh, Luke Getze is a brand new offensive coordinator coming into the Raiders. You know, he wasn't the offensive coordinator last year. So there's going to be, you know, a new scheme, I'd imagine. Um, And I guess the perfect, if you're going to switch to a lefty, you know, the perfect way to do it or without like throwing everybody off of what they've been practicing, you know, because new offensive coordinator is just going to do that regardless um you know if you're gonna go with the left-handed guy wouldn't it be perfect to do it in the first year with the new offensive coordinator no yeah i agree and And then right now it'd be the time to do that and then also you know bill walsh one of the greatest minds in you know nfl history uh i think that part of the reason why he liked steve young was because he was a lefty and and bill walsh was a boxing fan um, you know, from what I've heard and, you know, Southpaws always have like the advantage of, uh, you know, when they're f- fighting somebody who's, who's right-handed, um, you know, it's, uh, it just changes everything. Like on the football field, it would, it would just change everything. All the, uh, the defenses are so used to, you know, if you're going to rush the quarterback, you're rushing their blind side, you know, with your top pass rusher. Now it's like, are you going to move them to the other side? It, it's, you know, the pursuit angles are a little bit different because most of the offense was probably going to run, you know, to the quarterbacks, like, you know, uh, you know, away from the quarterback's blind side. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I don't think it's like a huge deal, but it's like little things like that it can give you a little bit of an advantage. Um, Like, I don't, I don't think like Tua being left-handed gives them like an unfair advantage or anything. I don't think like Mike Vick being left-handed was like super unfair or anything, but like it could be enough to just throw off a defense from whatever they're like normally used to seeing. Mm. So it could be an advantage rather than a disadvantage is what, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, it's, I, I just, I can't wait for the draft, honestly. Mm. So, yeah, um, I'm going to get to the, the remaining comments and then I don't know if you have, you know, uh, if you want to wrap up Raiders remaining needs for the draft or if we should get to our next topic. Yeah, I'm pretty much done. We can go through the comments and then move on. All right. Uh, Joel says rankings and mock drafts only mean so much. It really depends on when the run for quarterback happens. 
and uh, or any other position. 100%. I think Josh was kind of talking about this earlier about like which quarter or which teams are quarterback needy and going to be going for quarterbacks. Like it, when you look at this, it's like the Raiders being at 13 is really unfortunate because it looks, at least as of today, there are two waves of quarterback needy teams. There is one through three, and then there's the Cardinals and Chargers who are like trade down options. And then you have the Giants, which is like this wild card team. And then at eight, before Kirk Cousins, the, you had the Falcons, but now with Kirk Cousins, they're not going to do anything. I think personally, a wild card team for a quarterback, if they were uh, forward thinking enough, is sitting at 10th overall, named the New York Jets. But uh, because Dude, they have a forty-one-year-old quarterback, you can't. All right, Aaron Rodgers. But they're all they're all in. Aaron Rodgers would just Aaron Rodgers would just like complain yeah. about it and be like, "Oh, I left the Packers and they're doing it again." You know, there's no yeah, there's no way. And then For, like there, I Robert Sala will be fired if Rodgers does not work out in the next year or so. Yeah. So drafting a quarterback is a waste. Yeah. I don't see Rodgers making it past this season, honestly, but we'll see. Maybe he stays the second year after this, but, um, and really that, that 10th spot is probably where the second wave starts because 11 is the Vikings. 12 is the Broncos. 13 is the Raiders. And that's really the second wave. So the first wave is one, two, three. Second wave is 11, 12, 13. And then there's these two wildcard teams for me, the giants and the, and the, Jets, but the Jets are really far back. Like, don't expect that. Everybody's talking about the the Jets going for a wide receiver. They just signed Mike Williams. They also signed two offensive tackles at left and right, Tyron Smith, and they traded for uh, forgetting his name from the Ravens, but uh, they're both above thirty years old. They should be drafting an offensive tackle, point blank. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm just I look at the roster and I'm like, man. You know, they, they could go for a quarterback if there was one sitting there that they like, but uh, I don't, I don't see it. it. But but point being here, I think there are going to be two big runs, and I think the Vikings are going to trade up from that 11th spot to top four to five, get their guy. It's also possible they trade up with the fucking Patriots, and then the Patriots move that back to 11, and th that, that second wave is still ongoing. And then the Patriots will... We'd have to if we want Penix at that point, we'd have to jump the Patriots in good ten. You know what I mean? Like that that second wave is huge because if the, okay, let's say the Vikings move up with the Cardinals, whatever the Cardinals pick best player available when it comes, we still have the Broncos ahead of us. If they like Penix, they could strike. I forgot about the Broncos. They're definitely in the market. They for need a quarter. They have nobody. Yep. They have Stidham. All they have is Stidham. So that's the unfortunate part with the Raiders draft, you know, current predicament. Um, I will admit, though, the one guy that I keep forgetting is like a part of this draft. And when I say forgetting, I mean, I do not intend mentally for the Raiders to draft this guy. But Bo Nix, I'm just so out on him for some reason. Um, and I couldn't even tell you why. I just I, I haven't liked what I've seen so far. And he, he just feels like a little slightly faster Derek Carr to me, you know, maybe slightly better decision. I don't know, but I just, maybe I want something more, maybe slightly more Christian too. No, actually much <laughs> less, but, um, but like maybe he's more willing to throw the ball past the line of scrimmage than Derek Carr. Okay. But he's not as good of a deep passer as Derek Carr. That's one of my main issues. Whereas Michael Penix, man, his deep passing accuracy is, very good, very good. And just I remember uh, Antonio Pierce talking about like what they want at quarterback. It was like, we want somebody who could throw the ball downfield and, you know, fit in our offense. And it's just like Michael Penix can throw the ball downfield. That's for sure. And you could probably formulate your offense to him. You know, I just he just screams Raiders to me. But uh, mm -hmm. maybe the Broncos could go Bo Nix and it would just make me happy. I, I have no idea. I just find it funny, like, Antonio Pierce's want for for a quarterback, you know, because 
obviously the Raiders are going to look to draft one. Uh, his want for a quarterback in the draft, you know, was so simple, you know, the way you described it and like Kyle Shanahan, when he was naming the the perfect quarterback, you know, that, that he would want to draft, he's like, uh, I would want somebody with, with Lamar Jackson's mobility and Drew, Drew Brees' arm. Yeah. So specific. Um, but Ruben Luna says, bang, bang. Uh, Ruben, thank you for checking us out again. Also, I didn't get to Fonzie's comment. Uh, I hope Fonzie was able to watch the show, but, uh, you know, just hasn't, uh, been commenting. We started the show a little late today. Fonzie's comment came in, you know, before we started. So, uh, we appreciate the support even, even before the show. And then Joel said this earlier, what it do, uh, we've been getting to your comments. Let's get to your most recent one. Uh, we appreciate you, Joel, by the way. Um, and then this is referring to Penix. Uh, he does have injury history, but proved he can stay healthy over the past two seasons. And the age gripe people, um, you know, oh, people have. They ate, okay. The gripe that people have isn't fair, in my opinion, uh, when he's the same age as Jaden Daniels and younger than Bo Nix. Yep, that's the other thing about Bo Nix. He's 25. And honestly, the age doesn't affect me one bit. I, to scouts and, like, the media, it's a thing. To me, it's like, no matter what, they're going to be on – if he's a first-round pick, he's on a five-year rookie deal. I don't give a shit. And then he's going to hit his prime right as you sign him rather than, like – it just – I don't know. I I don't care about the age. As long as he's not, like, 26, like uh, Malik Hooker last year. Or not – Hendon Hooker. You know, like that's a little old, but twenty-four, that's fine. That's fine. Quarterbacks right. last. If they're if they're a great starter, they're gonna last. Yeah. So did you know that uh right now Patrick Mahomes is twenty eight? Could you imagine if he was twenty nine? Ugh. Well, I okay. I'll give you the counter though. Like Anthony, Anthony Richardson is twenty two. So no, uh, I, I know it's good that they're young. Like, you know, that's definitely good, but it's not everything. Like, yeah. I yeah. I was like heavily looking forward to Trey Lance because of his his young age. He's like he's younger than me. I just turned 25 last week. Happy birthday yep. to me. Uh yeah. but uh yeah, Trey Lance is like what 24? He's younger Somewhere than the quarterbacks being drafted in this draft. Or yeah, as, some of them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he's been in the league. He's he's eligible for his fifth year option. So really, the number that matters is the years left on your rookie contract, not necessarily how old that you are, and how many wins you can create. You know, help gain on your team. Yeah, who's the guy? Who's the guy that's on the Rams that got drafted last year? Was it uh, Stetson Bennett? Yeah. How old was he? Like twenty eight. I think he was old. I also don't know what's going on with him. He's kind of off the roster for a little bit. Okay, so he's 26 now. Just kind of, I don't know. He just so finished he his rookie year. Yeah, and he's 26. I feel like that's that's a little bit late bloomer-ish. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or at least, I don't know. But 24 versus 25, it's it's fine. Although I, I guess Bo Nix would be the same age that uh, Stetson Bennett, who I'm saying was old, you know, is. Right. But nonetheless, let's get to our final topic. Mike, Brandon Ayuk has been very active on social media the you know past several weeks, ever since the 49ers lost the Super Bowl. Uh, Brandon Ayuk's family... Uh, by, by family, I mean like his, his inner circle. It seems like, I don't know if it's his girlfriend, fiance or wife, you know, I don't know the, the dynamic between him and his partner, um, or like the exact relationship is, um, nor does it necessarily matter. Um, uh, she obviously is close to him and she, you know, put out a video after the, you know, after the Super Bowl, saying something along the lines of, 
you know, this might be our last time at Levi's. And then like shortly after that, um, Brandon Ayuk's brother or, you know, maybe close friend that like, you know, is just like, oh yeah, he's my brother. Um, somebody who is referred to as Brandon Ayuk's brother is, uh, you know, posting, this is why we're going to be in Vegas next year. And then now today, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to share a tweet um, real quick. Let me, uh, let me pull it up. It was very interesting today. Um, hold on. Um, this is from Paul Gutierrez, the initial tweet. So there's going to be there's going to be two different pictures that are shown. Uh, this is from Raider at Raiders Two Maney, um, you know, on Twitter, who posted like the interesting timing, you know, and posts both these screenshots. But uh, Paul Gutierrez reports that one hurt. Uh, Raiders coach Antonio Pierce on running back Josh Jacobs leaving in free agency. It's a business. Money talks, BS walks. Brandon Ayuk, um, you know, several hours after that, posts this on his Instagram story. Just a picture of his ceiling, or actually that, that actually looks like a sauna. It looks like he's inside of a sauna. Yeah. So it yep. could be a sauna or it could be a ceiling of like a wood house or stairs. Um, and money talks, bull poop walks. The exact same thing that Antonio Pierce, who coached him in college, said. It, does it mean anything? Probably not. Is it cryptic? Yes, it's very cryptic. And this is something similar to what Debo Samuel did. Uh, when the 49ers, you know, didn't uh, extend them right away in, in the off season, the 49ers like to wait until like right before the season begins or right before training camp begins in order to, um, you know, extend a player. They're not afraid of players missing training camp time. Although I will say we weren't concerned with Nick Bosa's, I guess overall performance, you know, or, or, you know, his health going into the season, not having a training camp, but there was a clear like production dip at the beginning of the season for, for Nick Bosa. And then he didn't like get better until the season went along. Um, but, you know, P uh, I've heard people say that they're not like worried about Brandon Ayuk showing up to camp in shape. Um, like if he were to miss time, which I'm sure that he would like, you know, play the holdout game. Yeah. Um, I just don't know how much leverage he has. Like if he was to hold out, you know, the, I think he's still under contract next year. No, no, he's not under contract next year, but the Niners can franchise tag him. Mm. Yeah. So they can hold <clears throat> him for two years if they really wanted to like get like nasty with it. Yeah. But they didn't get know. nasty with it with Debo. And no. we've been saying this entire time, like, I think I think Brandon Ayuk is worth more to this franchise at this current state than Debo is. Yes. You know, I, I even though Debo even though Debo's currently getting paid more, that's because he got paid a big contract two years ago. You know, I think you give in the age and the production of last season for these two receivers, and I think it's pretty clear that Ayuk's the number one. Debo might be the more recognized guy. That's debatable. But Ayuk is the guy that is kind of your prototypical number one wide receiver in this league. And uh, he's not a guy that you should be letting go of. Now, Mike, obviously Ayuk has some sort of connection with uh, Antonio Pierce. And there's just been, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. There might be a little bit of desire for Ayuk to maybe want to end up in Vegas. Do you think it happens? Do I think it happens? No. But I will say, I, I wonder if him tweeting that is his way of hinting, not to the Niners, but to the Raiders. Because through the NFL rules, Antonio Pierce can't speak to Brandon Ayuk. 
I mean, maybe if they just so happen to end up at an event together, I guess they could, maybe. But you never see, like, Mike Tomlin hanging out with uh, since Joe Burrow, you know? You'll never see them in public together because I'm pretty sure that you're not allowed to do that. That's like tampering. I'm really glad you mentioned that. Last week, Brandon Ayuk tweeted at Mike Tomlin, another team that has been linked to Brandon Ayuk. Yeah. You know, as now, like <clears throat> potentially, you know, the, the I guess the, the rumor is that the Steelers are interested in trading for Brandon Ayuk. Um, Brandon Ayuk tweeted at Coach Tomlin. Uh, it was, they say we look alike. Uh, what do you think? Or right. something along those lines. Yeah. Are these cries for, hey, come get me? Is yeah. this like Antonio Pierce, come get me? Mike Tomlin, yeah. come get me. Somebody pay me. Yeah. I think he wants to get paid and he's under contract with the Niners. And I think he probably has a good idea of how this works. You know, he's not just going to leave the Niners unless somebody trades for him. So he can make out the cry to get traded. Perhaps he doesn't see the vision with this Niners team. Perhaps he thinks, you know, Purdy's fine and all, but I want to win, and maybe he thinks the Niners' window's closing. I don't know. I think he's probably looking at it from a personal standpoint, not a team standpoint. He probably has respect for Mike Tomlin because of him being a great coach in this league for, what, probably 20 years. He probably has great respect for Antonio Pierce because he – he played for Arizona State at the same time that I want to say Antonio Pierce is the defensive coordinator. He probably got to know him a little bit and probably really likes him and how forward uh, Antonio Pierce is. Um, I'm sure being coached by Kyle Shanahan one day and then Antonio Pierce the next day would be a shell shock to an NFL player. You know, um, I, I I think that, but at the end of the day, I think this is all a tactic. Again, I said he's looking at this personally, not for him a team standpoint. I think this is all just a tactic to get paid. You know, no offense to him. That's what he should be doing right now, I guess. Just some players hold out, some players don't. And I don't know why receivers <laughs> have to be the divas when it comes to this stuff, but they do, you know. It very occasionally you'll get the guy that just you know, doesn't make a peep and then gets paid promptly like Devonte Adams, you know, but a lot of the times it's these receivers that just have to throw all these tantrums about getting paid and wanting to get traded. Debo did it a year or two ago. You know, I think at the end of the day, Ayuk's going to get paid. Although I think it's interesting that a tweet or two came out about, Oh, uh, the Niners asked the Jaguars for a, for the 17th overall pick. And Zay Jones? Yeah, and a player. I think it was Zay Jones. There's no way that that's real, in my opinion. That's that's ridiculous if that's real. I don't know if that was like Brandon Ayuk leaking something fake or if that was somebody just trying to make fun of the Jaguars because they had just lost Calvin Ridley. I have no idea, but I was just like, oh, that just doesn't sound right to me. That actually sounds a lot like Eric Armstead. X amount mm -hmm. of years ago, you know, and then they could go to the 17th pick and just draft a receiver. No, no, no DeForest Buckner. Same... Thank you. Thank you. DeForest Buckner. And then they draft Javon Kinlaw. That would be the same thing if they did this. It, let's just trade Brandon Ayuk right before he gets paid, and then we're going to just draft a receiver. And then they draft a guy, and he fucking sucks. That's not worth this it. This would be – it wouldn't be the same. It would be better. It would be better because – I feel like premium defensive tackles are way harder to find than premium wide receivers. Yes. And also you shouldn't be forced to pick a wide receiver in the first round. You could find great receivers in the second and third round. Yeah. Debo so. Samuel was a second rounder. Um, Devontae Adams is a second rounder. Cooper yeah. Cup was a third rounder. So yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I don't know, but I, I think, you know, I've already said, like, I would trade Debo and re-sign Ayuk if he could, but Debo's contract's pretty steep, you know. There's rumors that the Ravens wanted to look into to Debo, but 
I don't know if they even have the space for that, you know. The Niners would have to do that probably post June first because of the, the right. cap relief. Yeah. Um but man, the Ravens would be so like smart to pick Debo because good luck defending an RPO with Derrick Henry, Debo Samuel, and Lamar Jackson. Yeah. And then um I don't know if you have anything else on this, but I, I wanted to play a little game for this topic just because it's kind of the title topic and all that. And we can just get a little hypothetical here. Um, how about you give me a trade offer involving Brandon Ayuk and the Raiders, and then I can either accept or counter our offer. Okay. Let, let's make a rule. Let's just throw out all the ridiculous offers. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like, right. Uh, no Brandon Ayuk for for uh, Daniel Carlson. Okay. No, no. Yeah, no. I'm not doing yeah. that. Yeah. I'll try to be real. Okay. Yeah, you're like I'm not doing that. Carlson's good. Yeah. No, I'm just playing. Uh, okay. So I'll go with the offer that I that I told you about earlier. Um, you know, I I think we we were texting earlier. Would you, Mike? Would you take uh Brandon Ayuk? For Jacoby Myers and a first round pick. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Fine. I'll I'll do it myself. Um oh no. Uh no, I'd have to think about it. I'm just fine. No, okay. First round pick Jacoby Myers. At home. <laughs> uh Jacoby Myers and a first round pick for Ayuk. So the problem I have with this, I think Jacoby Myers is on a perfect deal with the Raiders right now. And which first round pick are you looking for? Are you looking for a 13th overall pick or are you looking for next year? Well, I think it would make more sense for this year. But if it had to be next year, you know, all right. If all right, like, let's just say it was next year. Add a fourth. Mm, add a fourth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, would say a I third, th- but I feel like that's kind of steep for one receiver. Yeah. We are, are going to decline. No, decline. Decline your offer, but we can counter. Okay, counter. <laughs> let's see. This. This. This trade might have to happen during the draft. You know what, actually? I just I can't see it, dude. I don't see it for the Raiders. I think, again, Jacoby Myers' contract is perfect. He's got two years left at like $11 million per year, which is perfectly fine with me for what his production was last season. Um, oh, okay, let me look at the roster really quick. I mean... It's just like wide receiver is not a need. The only thing, the only thing that makes that gets Ayuk to excite me is that I think he can continue to progress and he may already be a top 10 receiver in this league. You know, okay. Now, figure that you have a rookie quarterback, right? Yeah, that's, that's that you what draft, I was going to say. Assume that you draft Penix at 13. Yeah. Assume that, that, that that's the pick uh, or another rookie quarterback. And all you have to do is give up a first and a fourth next year and Jacoby Myers. Ayuk, I think we can both agree, is an upgrade over Jacoby Myers. Yeah. And I think we can both agree that Devontae Adams isn't going to last forever. That was going to be made, one of my main points is getting Ayuk is nice because Devontae Adams will not be lasting more than. Well, I think in theory he could last more than his current three-year contract remaining, you know, but he's not going to be the same guy. Like, IU could become the number one, and I and Devontae, if he stays at the Raiders, would be like that Roddy White role with the Falcons on their Super Bowl run. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just a re- reliable pass catcher. Um And I would say also getting Ayuk to pair with Devontae for a rookie quarterback would just be nasty. Sort of similar to what the Bears have done with DJ Moore and Keenan Allen for 
what we all assume to be Caleb Williams. I have to um, say, Devontae and Ayuk would be a better duo than DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. But same oh, idea. Easily. Yeah, same I'm idea. Saying, very, very similar. Like Keenan Allen, Devontae, very similar. I think Devontae is better, but Keenan Allen's great. And then, you know, DJ Moore is the more athletic guy. And I think, you know, Brandon Ayuk is kind of the ascending player like DJ Moore. Um, and I would say Ayuk is probably the more prototypical guy compared to DJ Moore. But like being re realistic with the team and the team build and like, oh, we have these other needs, a tackle and corner. You know, I can't go giving up my first round pick this year because we're we're going to spend it on somebody that we're going to need. It's going to be the quarterback or it's going to be Fuaga, Latham, a corner, you know, Quinnon Mitchell or, or Terry and Arnold. Um, so I think my counter offer. Is uh, whew. oh fuck, man. Because we'd have to re we'd have to sign Ayuk. That's the tough part. Mm -hmm. And I guess yeah, you guys would still want to. Oof. I've got a counter. Go ahead. Would you take Brandon Ayuk? And a fourth round pick mm -hmm. for next year's first and and next year's third. Or this oh, how about this year's fourth, the next I mean oh, let, let, let me restart. Brandon Ayuk, this year's fourth, and the Raiders give next year's first and this year's third. And no, and and Jacoby no, Myers, and Jacoby Myers, and Jacoby Myers. Yeah, I'm, I'm still, I'm gonna counter, I'm gonna counter that offer. Um, due to realism, I will include Jacoby Myers, even though I don't want to. I think in a perfect world, the Raiders keep Jacoby Myers, and he's the slot guy. Really, they probably all kind of intertwine and go all over the formation and then you have Dre Tucker as the speed receiver. Um, but because of the way that we're building our team, I would, and the fact that we have to pay Brandon Ayuk, uh, my counter offer would be a third round pick this year. If that's where you're starting, just, just, Keep it to yourself. Well, no, no, no. I was gonna, I was gonna offer a second round pick next year. A third this and, year and a second next year. And Jacoby Myers, but I really don't want to give up mm. Jacoby Myers. That's not a bad counter. It's not a bad counter. Yeah. I thought, and, I thought it was just gonna start with a third and then go to like a fourth. You know, like I was like, yeah, you know what, you can save that. Stick it where the sun don't shine. God damn, dude. I'm still having a hard time sending Jacoby Myers. Like, I think yeah, if but you're getting Brandon Ayuk. Yeah, but if we're going to draft a quarterback, like, man, that would help him so much. Having all three of them, especially if one of them were to go down for a couple weeks, you know, you still have the other two guys. I think, I think my, my official offer is third round pick this year. Okay. Second round pick next year and a fourth round pick next year. I just don't see the Niners accepting that. That's crazy. It's, it, it's not a bad offer. It would be wiser for you to just resign him. Probably. Yeah. I mean, but then again, I mean, you could get a good ass receiver in the third or second round, third this year, second next year. But it's not guaranteed. And you're still in a. Super Bowl window, so why would you get rid of them? You know what I mean? The only way it would make, I guess, more sense would be a third and then next year's second and next year's third. Yeah, I just I don't see the Raiders wanting to have that big of a gap in the draft next year. Mm -hmm. Joel asks, how much do you think Ayuk would get paid, though? 
I see it, it being 25, around 25 per year, probably closer to 28 because of the way the market is right now for receivers. Yeah, I, th- I think because of the market, I mean, let's ask ourselves, what did what did uh, Calvin really get paid? Because it's going to be more than that. I want to say it was four years, 92, which um, that's like 26 per year. I can check in a minute. Uh, right now, I'm checking to see Brandon Ayuk's market value on SpotRack. Uh, so the calculated market value that SpotRack has is around $24 million per year. His market value is a four-year contract worth $96 million. Oh. So let's see. Uh, you were asking about Calvin Ridley? Yeah, let's find Calvin Ridley. Four years, ninety-two million. Yeah. So I mean, Ayuk's going to ask for way more than that, and I think honestly, because of the way this market is, and because Ayuk is on a winning team, that he probably feels he is the number one receiver on. He'll probably ask for the contract that like Devonte Adams has, because Devonte signed it two years ago and it was top of the market at that time, but now he's like the fifth, if not like seventh highest paid receiver in the league. Is there? I don't know if you could find a list of like the top ten highest paid receivers right now let me find it okay um fell top um how do i find okay all right uh wide receiver Top salaries. Okay. Yeah. I'll share it. Yes. Because I'd say he'd land somewhere in the middle, if not towards the top. Okay. Uh, you, you can see it, right? Yep. So Tyreek Hill, 31, almost $32 million per year. Yeah. It's crazy. It's Super worth crap. it for them. Shit. Cooper Cup almost thirty million, not worth it anymore. Debo it's not Samuel, worth it anymore. 20, sorry, it's not worth it anymore. Million. Cup's not worth it anymore. But when you pair in that uh, Puka Nakua is making next to nothing, it evens out. But as so, far as Debo, yeah, I don't think Debo's worth it anymore. No. Personally, and and in my opinion. I think Ayuk asks for 29 flat. I think he probably th- says, I want to get paid like Debo, if not higher, just slightly. I want to pass Debo. Maybe. Um, I also think, you know, and this is why I don't know if uh, Ayuk going to the Raiders necessarily makes sense because I feel like a lot of the speculation has been that Brandon Ayuk wants to be a number one wide receiver. You know, he wants to be the top option. And if he goes to the Raiders, it's still going to be Devontae Adams, probably. Yeah, it would. It would. Yeah. And there's no way the Raiders are going to pay more than $50 million for, per year. No, yeah, for two receivers. That's tough. I just think all the writing on the wall is like the Raiders can't really afford this trade, you know, and the contract paired with it. So I you to the Raiders. I say highly unlikely. For, you know, one reason being uh, the the contract, you know, the financial reason. And then the other reason being, it seems like the 49ers are working to try and keep Brandon Ayuk. Yeah. And I I really think that's the end goal even for Ayuk. And I think if Ayuk's a a smart guy that understands how this league runs, he probably knows that Debo's going to last only one or two more years with the Niners. And then it's his show and his show only. You know, mm-hmm. Ayuk. So if he can get paid, the sooner the better for him. And then it's going to be the Brock Purdy to Brandon Ayuk show in like two years or less for sure. Because I think Debo and Kittle are probably gone. That's assuming that Brock Purdy is able to get extended as well with the 49ers. Because with their cap situation, I mean, all right, uh, bonus topic. Who needs to be off this team 
in order for the Niners to be able to afford to re-sign Brock Purdy by the time he, you know, he's eligible. So after this year, I think, I, yeah, I think, I think Kittle think might, might be retired. Debo's gone. Retired. Debo's number one because he's at that 28 mark. That's insane. Kittle probably because I'm sure he's like top three to five tight end right now. And it's like, you can't re-sign him to a top five deal anymore. You got to just let him go. If you can trade him for something to recoup, that's good. But, uh, you know, I, I just don't see them keeping K- Kittle at a massive rate. The The big question is Trent Williams. Does he retire by then? Does he keep, does he go throughout his contract to get all of his earnings? Um, let's just assume, I mean, don't they still have to pay Trent Williams? Even they're going to, if he retires. Yeah. He probably has, he probably has guarantees that are specifically involved, but, uh, like if he retired after this season and he has two years left on his deal, there's probably a lot of it that he wouldn't get, you know? Mm. So at least there's Um, that. So Trent Williams, Okay, but but for sure, Debo and probably Kittle will have to be gone. What about Charvarius um, Ward? Charvarius Ward is probably gone. I think. I think. How about this? Your keepers. Let's say you're, you're planning on keeping Purdy. Okay. Your uh-huh. other key. Oh, I'll give you the other guy that has to go. Christian McCaffrey, number one paid running back in the league. He's got to go. No, and he the, doesn't the, have to. Well. His cap look hit is. Austin, look at Austin Eckler. Within two years, he went from the number one running back, at least in fantasy, to, yeah, good luck in Washington getting four point five million dollars per year. You know, like the running back, uh, age, limit, like just plummets at like twenty nine. You know. But you could argue that Christian McCaffrey is better than Austin Eckler ever was. Oh, 1000%. And he's also, he seems to be one of the best at making sure that his body is prepared for the NFL, you know, game. Granted, I think every player hits that point in their, in their career where it's like, my body is not taking this the same as it used to, you know, Mm -hmm. and eventually their, their clock runs out and running backs tend to be the position whose clocks run out the fastest. So, you know, if you can turn McCaffrey into a committee in two to three years, maybe you could still trade him for something big. But paying a running back $16 million right now just is completely abnormal to team building. And I think that is a that is a result of not paying a veteran quarterback. You're able to do that with McCaffrey. You're able to have... Boza, Trent Williams, all these great players on your team. But when it's time to pay Purdy, we're going to see, dude. We're definitely going to see. I'd say as far as guys that probably won't be. Well, he's got three years on his deal, though. Yeah, that one's tough. They might keep him. He's worth keeping. Well, depends on how he plays, I guess. But uh, I'd say the guys that are going to be kept will be, you know, Purdy, but. Boza, Warner, and I would say you let Trent Williams play out his contract. Uh, and Ayuk. I, I'd say those are the five. Purdy, Ayuk, Boza, Warner, Trent Williams. I don't know if Ayuk is, is a lock, but I'll, I'll just say, uh, and this will be my last thing, um, do I think the 49ers will move on from Brandon Ayuk? Probably not. Do I think that they should? They they should at least see what they can get for him. If they can get, you know, a, a pretty good return for him, it's probably in the team's best interest to get the get the return and go younger. You know, yeah. and less expensive. That way you can have money to spend on, you know, filling gaps and re signing, you know, other players. Because <clears throat> I mean, I don't know. Um, my, my they have a lot is, of expensive contracts, and Bosa's contract hasn't even kicked in. Yeah. My question to you is, you know, with this current Super Bowl window, do you want to risk losing your arguably number one receiver 
for a young quarterback, you know, right and coming off of a Super Bowl loss, you know, like that's risky. And imagine Debo going down week two. Who's your top receiver? Juwan Jennings and a rookie. Do, do I want to? No. Um, I'm just saying you said now, it was like possibly for the best interest or whatnot. Like that that's sketchy for the current team. Maybe for the future, yes. But for this current window, losing Ayuk is a massive hit. Okay, but if Debo Samuel was current it was still playing on his rookie contract, you'd say you know he's he's a hell of a player for for you know the the price that he's at. Ayuk and, and Debo are you know, I, I understand they're two completely different, you know, like skill sets, but you could probably find another young receiver to give similar production to what Brandon Ayuk does. Not not necessarily the same efficiency of getting open. Like Ayuk is one of those players who's nearly always always open. Yeah. But you know the 49ers ranked 32nd in passing. They passed the least out of every team in the NFL. And, you know, Ayuk isn't even the, the like, first option. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like McCaffrey. Mm. Then then it's like Debo. And then Ayuk just kind of like, I mean, he got, he got what? Four, four targets in the Super Bowl? And that's that's yeah, with everything on the that's, line. That was kind of when everything started. All this, you know, drama. Yeah, I think he wants to be featured. The 49ers need to need to cut the crap. If you're going to pay Ayuk, let him earn the money. Don't mm-hmm. just pay him. Yeah. Don't. No more expensive decoys. No more. Yeah. No, I, I can agree with that. I think if if you're going to use. Well, if your offense is going to be this run first, you know, McCaffrey, McCaffrey, and then occasional Kittle, Debo, this guy, that guy. Like, if Ayuk's not going to be this featured player, don't pay him like it. You know, I can agree with that for sure. If you can get a big return for him, draft a receiver plus a defensive end and plus a defensive tackle or plus an offensive guard or, or right tackle, that's massive. Um, but it's a very low likelihood that all those picks are gonna are gonna hit, you know. Um, I just think when you know two years from now we're looking at this this team on paper and saying, well, McCaffrey's not getting any younger, and we just re-signed Purdy to a forty nine per year forty nine million dollar per year contract or whatever yeah. he's gonna get. Let's- Let's put you know, 49. Purdy's putting the 49 in 49ers. Yeah. So we just re-signed our quarterback to a massive deal. Uh, and, he, you know, we're, we're stuck with him, for lack of a better term, for the next five years. Um, and we're going to let his star receiver go. And his other receiver is turning 30 or whatever, you know. And he's not even a prototypical wide receiver. He's like – half running back, half receiver, and his wear and tear is way worse than most wide receivers, Debo. You know, I just, I think under the assumption that they're going to keep Purdy, I feel like Ayuk almost should be a package deal with that because if you keep Purdy on a big contract but you don't have any more Pro Bowl receivers for him to throw to, it's like, well... You're not going to have McCaffrey forever either. So what are we doing here? You know, it, it's a tough, it's a tough situation. I I see your side to it completely. I just I'm like, man, you know, from a team building perspective, coming off a Super Bowl window is not fun. You're not well, off of it yet, but it, it's going to get here quick. You say that having IU should be part of the package deal. I would I would argue that more. In, like a more impactful thing would be what if the 49ers are able to trade for a first round pick, you know, for, for Ayuk, and then they draft a starting right tackle who's actually like, you know, good, mm-hmm. can pass protect, right. you know, uh, a good run blocker, like, you know, a perennial 
like let's just say they make you know they're like a pro bowl right tackle yep you know maybe not all pro but they're you know they're they're actually good you protect purdy you give whoever the wide receiver that is stepping into Brandon Ayuk's role more time to get open cuz you can only cover for so long in the NFL um you give them more time to get open and um uh, you can actually run the ball hmm. but you know what even if we could run the ball i don't know that the coach would would call it in the super bowl w- with uh everything on the line so yeah. you know what? If we're not going to run the ball, we better keep Ayuk. <laughs> I just think if you're going to keep a quarterback on the massive deal that he's going to get, then you better keep the quarterback on the field and give him protection on the offensive line. And 1, I would rather them put that money into the offensive line than to put it into a receiver they hardly throw to. Yeah, I guess my thinking is, and I love keep- Ayuk. Yeah, I I just my thinking is if you can keep Ayuk at Debo's price, and then just get rid of Debo, you're kind of getting Ayuk for free. You're just losing a Debo. Does that kind of make sense? Well, you you would technically like let's just say exactly what you said. You wouldn't be losing a Debo. You would just be losing. Well, yeah, losing a Debo, but at Ayuk's contract. Like I yeah, but- contract would replace Debo's contract and Debo's would just be gone. Yeah. You know, or so then you, you could yeah. spend that towards whatever else. Like well, I not Debo's, like what 14 actually, million, 14 million uh this upcoming year. So possibly. So yeah. Like Ayuk just slides into Debo's contract slot, if you you know, if you will. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not um, sure how it work, but yeah, we'll see how it goes, man. Yeah, moral moral of the story, or I guess to sum it up, I really like Brandon Ayuk. I hope that he stays with the team, but if the 49ers can get, you know, a good package for him that would lead to an offensive lineman, you have to go. You have to prioritize the offensive line. I'm tired of not doing it because the offense literally runs through the offensive line and Jim Harbaugh literally put it this way today. And this will be my mic drop moment. He prioritizes offensive line because they're the one position group on the field that doesn't depend on anyone else to succeed. It's up to them, you know, to succeed quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, everyone else. They can only go as far as their offensive line takes them. Mic drop. Yeah. Mic drop. Unless like the quarterback calls out the wrong protection or something. But even still. I I totally I agree. I do agree. Um with the coaching could just suck. Yeah. But and and for my mic drop, for the question at hand, I do not see Brandon Ayuk being a raider. Um unless he somehow becomes a free agent, but I don't see the Raiders trading for him. So. I don't see it either. Yeah. Yeah. So. But, uh, you know, everybody, I, I guess that's the show. Um, you know, I appreciate Fonzie, Joel, Ruben uh, for checking us out, you know, leaving comments. Uh, I always put, please comment, like, and subscribe, you know, right here. I never really, like, say it out loud. Maybe I should, you know. Uh, if you're watching at home, please like, please comment. And please subscribe. It, it yeah, helps hey, out the channel. It helps out the channel, but also I love seeing comments on the on the episodes, even after the fact. I, w- w- each of us will come in and comment beneath your comment. You know, create a conversation. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, we love you know communicating with you guys. So. Yeah, you know, I'm starting to think that maybe at the beginning of each episode, like I, I, I would love to hit uh, 200 subscribers pretty soon. We've been like teetering at like 195, 196. But if we can get hit 200 subs, it, you know, pretty soon, that'd be uh, pretty cool. Uh, I'll give away um, 
a strand of Mike's beard. Um, <laughs> you know, as a free giveaway, uh, put it in like a little Ziploc bag. No, but uh, maybe at the beginning of every vid, you know, like video, I'll have to do it like YouTubers do. What's going on, YouTube? Smash that like button. Please subscribe. Uh, leave a comment. You know, uh, you know, and then just like you know, our video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. You know, uh, it's just like ridiculously over the top, uh, like positive. Right. Right. Yeah. Joel says, great show, boys. Great show, boys. Please smash that like button. I want you to completely obliterate that like button. Pretend it's somebody who's trying to kidnap your dog. What was that one guy that was like, give me the love bullets or something like that? Oh, the finger bullets? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have man. no idea what the context okay. was. but I'll tell you the context right now. So... No, no disrespect to this YouTuber. I'll even, you know, I'll keep their name anonymous, but I was trying yeah. to buy an Xbox series X. Right. And at the time there was a lot of like shortages of electronics. It was like during COVID there was, you know, chip shortages and silicone uh, shortages. Um, when I did the smash the like button thing, I like spit all over my mic <laughs> by the okay. way shout out to joel for sticking around the entire pod that's awesome yeah joel much appreciated so i was trying to buy an xbox and it was like hard to get an xbox way harder to get a ps5 but still it, like almost impossible to get an xbox too and then um so i was in college and then i think i i just had uh like a i didn't have class that day and I had sold my my Xbox um, in case uh, some certain people are watching. I won't say who I sold it to. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I sold my Xbox, and then I decided I wanted to get the Series X. And then, all right, I'm like... I think I waited all day for Best Buy to drop it. And then I was watching this one YouTuber who I guess goes live and will say, like, I guess he knows when, when like certain things are, are dropping like Walmart, Walmart ended up dropping, you know, the, the series X. And yeah. then he was like, Oh, everybody, you know, go, go try and order it from, uh, from Walmart. Right. And then, um, you know, so like everybody rushes over. They they try to do the order. They try to do the order. Oh, you know, Best Buy is supposed to drop. I waited eight hours for Best Buy to drop, and Best Buy never dropped. They were supposed to drop at a certain time, and this guy was supposed to tell everybody like, oh, you know, yeah, it's like any minute now, any minute now. So I'm like literally sitting, refreshing Best Buy all day, eight hours, and then like. I said, screw Best Buy. Walmart's dropping right now. This guy's saying it. But in the middle of the entire stream, he's just like, oh, I'm feeling the love bullets. And like, you know, would just like, you know, do it over and over, like every so often. And like it would play music and everything. And like, I just want you to imagine me like sleep paralysis, just stuck in my bed. I'm like, I just want an Xbox. I Like, you know, because... I'm not going to monitor every website all, you know, yeah. all day. Like I really wanted an Xbox. I didn't think it was going to take that long, but you get so invested into something. I'm not going to walk away from the day without an Xbox. Like, you know, I was two hours in and I'm like, I've already put enough work into this. I'm just going to go a little longer. And then it was a little yeah. longer. Never take me to Las Vegas. I will never get out of there. I will <laughs> leave without everything. Yeah. I'll leave with some love bullets though for some positivity. Please like, comment, and subscribe, guys. You'll always have those love bullets. I'll always have the love bullets. My Xbox got delivered with extra love bullets. So like I said, no disrespect to that YouTuber. That's just his thing. He's got a lot of, you know, he's got a following. You know, people like that. To me, I he helped me get my Xbox. 
but I would be lying if I said I didn't I didn't go crazy for like eight hours that day, just like laying in bed. Like, when is Best Buy gonna drop? Best Buy, oh my god, they dropped the ball that day. And I think Best Buy announced they that they were yeah, yeah. And then Walmart, Walmart came to the rescue. And then oh, the best part. I just texted Mike. I'm like, hey, the Xbox is up. Because I think Mike was kind of in the market. Mike did not wait. He just ordered it. Like, just, you know, open up the app. He's like, yeah, I got one too. Right there. Yeah. So, Mike, you know, I, I, can, I can officially say that I took bullets for Mike. Love bullets. Love bullets. Man. Yeah. So uh that's the story of that. You know, uh Joel, if if you stuck around for that, I hope that you create about like 20 YouTube accounts to subscribe to us in each one with different names and comment under each video. And uh yeah, we'll we'll catch you guys in the next one. Appreciate you guys. Mike, any last words before we get out of here? No, I'm looking forward to the draft. We're officially less than a month away. Mm-hmm. Last thing, no guarantee at an episode next week. I'm going to work on creating a Discord. Maybe we can do maybe we can have a Discord and kind of be a little bit more transparent with uh like our streaming schedule or like you know just to kind of keep everybody in the loop. Yeah, and in, in conversations, like if we want to talk ball and everything, I think that would be a great idea. So yep. Uh, we also Joel, we're still lagging on making uh <laughs> Joel sending Joel. love bullets. Uh still working on making social media, so I'll I'll probably try to do that this weekend, maybe. Yeah. So big things coming from the silver and gold. Uh yeah, we appreciate you guys. Uh and catch us in the next episode, whether it be next week, later next week. Kyle Shanahan, oh my God, uh, trades uh, three first and a third for Trey Lance again. He wants him back. No, I don't know. Uh, breaking news, right? All right. Have a good night, everyone. Peace.